Sorry that we kind of had some of the family hours spill into when the professionals arrived. Dr. Schreiber had offered to give a summary of the event from yesterday evening, which Wishes for Elliot hosted the, the, the leading clinicians and researchers in the SCNA Day community. So if you have questions when Dr. Schreiber returns at some point later in the evening, please do feel free to follow up with him. Um, so I first of all want to thank you all for coming to the second annual Acute Syndrome Foundation SCNA Day Clinician Researcher and Family Gathering. Thank you all for joining us this evening, for taking time out of your busy, busy schedules this weekend for our SCNA Day community. And I can say if history repeats itself, this should be a really inspiring and enlightening event for everybody. So thank you for coming. I've met many of you before at our inaugural, inaugural event last December in Philadelphia. But for those of you who don't know me, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce myself. I'm a pharmacist by trade and my husband's a physician and I can honestly say that I never expected our medical training um, to be used in our own home with our own child. Um, no amount of that medical training could have prepared us for the challenges of raising a daughter with a CNA day epilepsy. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the sequence of events that has led me here to where I am today with all of you. Adeline's seizures be five months of age and we ultimately, oh, I'm sorry, um, my slides, I believe, are out of order. I apologize. Um, so anyways, I'll continue. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about, well, apparently we're going to be like yesterday where I can't get the slides to advance. Okay. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the sequence of events that's led me here today. My daughter Adeline began having seizures at five months of age, and by seven months she was diagnosed with SCNA Day. Thank you. Since that fateful day in October of 2013, I've created the Facebook page Adeline, Help Adeline Find Answers in hopes of connecting with researchers and other families. It's where I've shared my daughter's journey publicly, um, every struggle and every celebration over the past three years in hopes of raising awareness of epilepsy, SUDEP, and SCNA Day specifically. I'm the creator and the administrator of the SCNA Day Family Support Group, which started as a small network of five families back in 2014 and has grown to an active, engaged community representing 100 or with 113 families working together to drive SCNA Day research and promote patient advocacy. Since 2015, I've served with Hilary Savoy as the SCNA Day Advisor to the Acute Syndrome Foundation. And in this role, I direct all SCNA Day Foundation efforts, including patient advocacy, community networking, and promoting our relationships with clinicians and investigators. So thank you all for being here. When Adeline was diagnosed with SCNA Day back in 2013, there was only one case reported in the literature. One. Remember Dr. Harris? <clears throat> and it was thought that Adeline was only the 12th known case worldwide. PubMed searches yielded very little in humans. Um, quite a bit was available in mice. And that was pretty much it. Desperate for scientific and personal, personal connections is when I created that page. Within three months, through Facebook, we connected with our first family. And by spring, two other families had found us just from going onto Google and searching the terms SCNA Day. One of them was actually the family of Elliot from Wishes for Elliot. Around that same time, Adeline's stability declined, and we made the decision to finally attempt treatment with oxcarbazepine, known in the United States as Trilithal. The choice to use a sodium channel blocker was unnerving due to the early confusion between treatment options for SCN1A versus SCN8A. I'm thankful we did have Dr. Mandy Harris to provide us with the rationale to support that decision and to emotionally support us through that decision with our daughter. By the summer, the support group was created and included eight members representing only five children with SCNA Day, all from the United States. We shared experiences and advice and compared treatment and therapy regimens. But most importantly, we supported one another. We finally found people with whom we could relate when it seemed the rest of the world could simply never understand the lives of those with children of SC with SCNA Day. To fast forward to today, Adeline walks, talks, runs, and fights with her big sister as she should as a three and a half year old. With this, it's important to clarify that there are three things I have never forgotten or taken for granted. The first being just how unwell Adeline once was not that long ago. The second being how fragile other children still are today. 
And the third being that everything Adeline has worked for, all of our children, everything they've gained can all disappear tomorrow. No matter what end of the vast spectrum a child is on SCN 8A, that's the reality for all of us. Seizures or not, we know that SUDEP exists. It's, it's not a secret anymore. We're aware of it and we're scared. If you remember, the support group started just two years ago and represented five people with STN 8A. Today we have 113, this is just a portion of them, 113 babies, children, and adolescents represented in our group coming from 22 countries across the globe. So two years, that's how much we've grown. As you can imagine, this amount of growth in our community has been a lot for this mom of three young children to manage alone. Because of this exponential growth, Within our community, four parent volunteers have stepped up to help moderate the family support group. I'm going to try and progress through my slides here. That's my, that's Adeline when she was a baby and her big sister. That's Adeline when she was first having seizures at five months. And then, sorry. <clears throat> so this is where I wanted to show the growth. So we have in the red the total known SDN8A diagnoses. And we have in the blue the number of SCN 8A patients that are represented in the support group um, over time. So if you see just in the last couple of years our exponential growth, we don't see this stopping. It happened in SCN 1A, it happened in SCN 2A, and there's no reason that it's not going to continue in our population as well. So with that, <clears throat> our support group has the four moderators that I mentioned. I would like to thank each of them publicly for their dedication to our community and willingness to sacrifice their time from their families to ensure that each new patient, when each new person is diagnosed, his or her family doesn't spend one unnecessary moment alone the way that many of us have. If you are at present, please stand when I say your name so we can all acknowledge your contribution to this community. Shelly? Maggie? Where's Maggie? There she is. Thank you both. And then also Sandy and Karen, who couldn't be here, are pictured with their beautiful families. Sandy's um, son, Cameron, that's being held by her husband, and um, Karen's daughter, Lily, in the red there, are both two of our SCNA Day children as well. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you. So that, despite our small number, we are certainly very strong in our fight. We come together to celebrate successes and mourn setbacks and losses together. We are SCN 8A family, and together we are SCN 8A strong. Since 2011, we know of seven lives that have been lost to SCN 8A. The families of all of these children remain connected with our support group, and they each make, a part, make up a big part of our SCN 8A family. Let's take a few moments to acknowledge, honor, and reflect upon the lives of these SCN 8A angels. As I go through, I'm going to see each of their names so you can see their pictures. <clears throat> Jay Hammer. James Clurry. Tristan Tong. This was the first family I connected with back in 2014. Easton Brunty. Rebecca Owens, Jacob Falls, and Dustin Ide. <clears throat> All of these children have a legacy that will live on through each of us in this room as we strive for successful treatments and improved quality of life, breakthroughs and advances in scientific research, and tireless patient advocacy and family support. What, what's, what once began as a desperate and very lonely quest for answers, appropriate treatment, and support for Adeline has transformed into what today is a battle for all, all of those with SCNA Day, including those whom we haven't yet met. <clears throat> this fight's bigger than her. It's bigger than all of these faces. We know that within a few years, this is how many people are going to be on this collage, okay? And this is what inspires us. It's not just for my child or the children represented here. It's, it's for what we know is to come. We know there are children out there undiagnosed. We know genetic testing is improving and it's happening more frequently, which is wonderful. We're getting, um, we just had our newest um, family from Syria last week. So it's, it's happening everywhere and it's wonderful, but we need to be prepared for this. We, we really do um, as a community and as 
um, professionals out in, in the workforce. Our goals are to ensure that no families are alone upon receiving diagnosis, to improve the lives of all those affected by SCN8A mutations, to inspire researchers to make SCN8A their life's work, and to save the lives of all of our children. While very significant to me, Adeline is only a piece of this journey. She lit the fire in me that has allowed me to reach to the ends of the earth to find anyone who knows anything about this disease. Watching all of these children struggle, and even some of them lose their fight, has kept that fire and quest for answers burning. Perhaps what is most motivating is that soon there will be thousands of these faces that we're fighting for. As you've learned, this has been a long journey for my family. It's one that I would not have would not have allowed me to be in front of you if it weren't for the support and partnership of my husband, Josh. He's here in the audience today. I wouldn't have been able to take on my roles within the SCN8A community nor the Cute Syndrome Foundation with as much passion and vigor as I have done without him by my side, especially with three small children. I think we have a wonderful agenda for this evening. I truly hope that each of you leaves feeling inspired to continue great work treating, researching, and advocating for epilepsy and specifically SCN8A. I have, I have to share the little known fact that last year in my early planning, I expected this to be a casual, very small gathering over pizza in my hotel room in Philadelphia. The overwhelming level of interest made me quickly realize that I'd be planning an event that was so much needed by this community of families and professionals to come together that we ended up hosting 100, nearly 100 individuals last year. We were a bit disorganized, to say the least. The menu offered a dinner that was anything but desirable. I apologize. <laughs> we had cold cuts that were warm and hot soup that was cold, so I'm sorry. Um, we, we started fundraising only four weeks before. We went over our time at the end of the evening, which as it looks now, we probably will again. Yet the response we received from so many of you was nothing other than a huge support and strong desire to join every year as we made this our plan to make it an annual event. And here you are again, thank you. This year we were fortunate enough to receive event sponsorship and I'd like to thank our sponsors for making today even better than our inaugural event. When I mention each company or organization, would representatives who are in attendance, sorry, I have to go backwards. Please stand so we can acknowledge you. <clears throat> Here we go. The Rare Epilepsy Network, RTI International, thanks, Barb. <clears throat> Xenon Pharmaceuticals, I believe there's a number of you. Thank you. And a number of you also attended last year. You've given us a lot, a lot of hope, and I, very, I feel very strongly and, and fortunate for the relationships that we've been able to foster. Thank you. Um, Upshur Smith Laboratories. No. And Pernomics. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you all for your willingness to support our young foundation and for recognizing the potential for long-term relationships with the SCN8A community. Being a nonprofit that is 100% volunteer run, all by SCN8A parents, your support was vital to this effort. Thank you for your generosity. Now I'd like to introduce you to our next speaker, my foundation partner and very dear friend, Hilary Savoy. Hillary is truly a pillar, an icon in our community. Through partnerships, Hillary has not only raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to support both PCDH19 and SCN8A epilepsy research, but she has also been pivotal, pivotal in increasing SCN8 awareness over the past two years. By taking me under her wing at the CUTE syndrome, Hillary has been with our partners by way of, um, excuse me, for grants specifically for SCN8A. While her daughter Esme is the CUTE, the namesake for the CUTE Center Foundation, by way of its admission, the SCN8A Canada community has been gifted a nonprofit home that has become the trademark of our SCA. Hillary has been a true team player. player. She took me in as her partner in 2015, and since that time has welcomed another nine parent volunteers who have been given a focus and a purpose to contribute to a community that is, one, is much larger than any of our individual children. I can honestly say that without a shadow of a doubt, we would not be in this room gathered together, clinicians, researchers, advocates, and families if it weren't for Hillary's unwavering dedication to our community 
and her uncanny ability to turn my often random and grandiose plans into a reality. Please join me in a round of applause as I present to you Hilary Savoie and her commitment to our community. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to try to make this, this short, but I have a, a little bit of a story to tell you. Um, so I'm Hilary Savoie. I'm the founder and director of the Acute Syndrome Foundation. And many of you already know me in that role, but I want to talk a little bit more on a, on a personal level. Um, as many of you may know, uh, my daughter Esme, who's six years old, has been unwell since birth uh, with a number of serious medical and developmental challenges. Uh, we didn't, when she was a baby, we didn't have a name to call what she had. So the quick wit of a very dear friend named Dana landed us with the name the cute syndrome for, for what Esme had um, because we knew she had something and she was really, really cute. So it worked. Um, at the end of 2012, we were finally given what we thought would be at least a partial diagnosis for my daughter and we dove into fundraising um, almost immediately starting the Cute Syndrome Foundation. Within a year, we had, we had helped to fund two major grants totaling over $150,000 with one of our partner organizations in Italy. <clears throat> but here's the thing. The disorder Esme had been diagnosed with, it's called TCDH19. A few years ago, after her diagnosis, we were told that to the best of everyone's genetic knowledge, which is, I think many of us in this room know, expanding daily, uh, it seemed like PCDH19, uh, her mutation, it wasn't likely disease causing after all. Instead, in late 2014, we were told that she had another mutation as well, one that might cause her symptoms. And it's the disorder that brings us here today, SCNA Day. Realizing very quickly how severe and frightening SCNA Day was, I took my sort of confusion about this change in diagnosis and focused as much as possible on how the foundation could change to uh, act on this new diagnosis. I very quickly got in touch with Michael Hammer, uh, with Jayetta and Gabby from Wishes for Elliot, and with, and with Julianne, who was running her Facebook uh, support group. And I dove in eager to, learn, to use what I had learned about PCDH19 and fundraising uh, to help the FDNA Day community. In the almost two years since then, we've made really wonderful strides, and I have to say, especially much since Julianne joined me as my partner. Um, we're two years into organizing this annual event. Uh, we've developed an SCIA clinic, uh, clinician reference guide, which some of you may have seen on your way in. Um, we formed a fruitful partnership with our friends at Epilepsia SCNA Day Brazil, and we funded two SCNA Day grants. Last year, we co-funded a grant to uh, Dr. Michael Hammer for his SCNA, SCNA Day registry with Wishes for Elliot. And early this year, we co-funded a grant to Dr. Miriam Meisler um, with Epilepsia SCNA Day Brazil for her SCNA Day research. But you know what? In those odd kinds of twists of fate and the ever-expanding knowledge behind modern genetics, in the last year, it's become clear that my daughter's SCNA Day mutation probably isn't the full source of her conditions either. Um, this is not an insignificant bump in my journey. Um, and it might be easier to have chosen to see, after investing so much time and energy in now two disorders that my daughter may not actually have, it would be easy to see that as a loss. And I would be lying if I said it wasn't uh, a difficult process and difficult for, for me to come to terms with, because it was. But it was also a gift of a kind. Um, the diagnostic change made it very clear to me that the Cute Syndrome Foundation is about something more than the apparently fickle nature of my daughter's genetic diagnostics. Because no matter what labels are given or taken away from Esme, she and I found something we've been looking for in the SCNA Day community. We found children who are like Esme, kids dealing with feeding and breathing and movement challenges. Um, we found a community that needed and wanted our help. And I found an amazing partner in Julianne. Uh, running this foundation is a true labor, labor of love, and Julianne has given so much um, to this community and her focus on family support and advocacy. 
um, and she has helped the Cute Syndrome Foundation become so much more than I ever imagined. In the SDN 8A community, we also found dedicated parents like Daniel. Could you stand up? And, and Nathan and Nera, please, if you would stand up as well. Um, they uh, work, they run a foundation in Brazil and have co-funded uh, a grant with us and are here running our AV and making sure that all of our international families can hear what we're doing here today. Um, and uh, thank you guys. Um, and also our long-term volunteers who help with fundraising, awareness raising, and advocacy. And could you all stand up when I call your name? Mackenzie, Mackenzie Wardrop, Dianali Cabrera, Jessica Jenkins. Uh, these are mothers who are willing to fight not only for their own children, but for something bigger for a whole community. And they do so with such open hearts and drive. Thank you guys. <clears throat> While my own daughter's diagnoses are still murky, uh, Michael Hammer, together with uh, another geneticist, Joseph Getz, have found two more genes that seem to be potential causes for her symptoms. They're called TBL, TBL1XR1. That's, I thought, PCDH19 was tough. Um, and MAP3K7, giving her a total of four genetic mutations. Our experience has been such that I am not holding my breath that this will be the last time our diagnosis changes. In fact, I still kind of feel weird claiming those awkward sets of numbers and letters for my daughter. And I hope someday that I will feel comfortable enough with her diagnosis that if needed, I will be able to fight for her in the way I now fight and dedicate myself for the SCNA community. But no matter what, what, what happens with her genetic diagnoses, no matter what, the SCNA Day community will be part of our mission at the Q Syndrome Foundation. I will support Julianne as our SCNA Day advisor in charge of running our family support group and driving the SCNA Day agenda of funding research, raising awareness, and supporting families, as she's done again this year with this event. Uh, no matter what we find in my daughter's genes, there is nothing that will change the feeling that my home is here with all of you. Uh, I have learned, if I've learned anything in this journey through coming to terms with uh, all of these changes, <laughs> it's that uh, the only way to move forward is together. Uh, I'm so pleased to know that there are so many of you here today who are dedicated to moving this work forward. Researchers, some of whose work the Q syndrome has funded in the past, both for PCDH19 and SCNA Day, clinicians wanting to improve the quality of care for their patients other organizations who will work to improve the quality of life for children like ours, and most especially families who are here to learn, help fundraise and organize and awareness raise. I'm deeply proud of the ways in which this, family commu this parent community has pulled together around Julianne's vision of not only a group on Facebook where families can find support, but also to an approach to the SCNA Day community that has been about including families in the most up-to-date understanding of research and clinical treatments, about collecting data about mutations and phenotypes since day one in preparation for registries and clinical trials, and about giving families and clinicians the tools like the SCNA Day Clinician Research Guide, a uh, reference guide, sorry, that we developed this year with the help of Dr. Mandy Harris and Dr. Philip Pearl to help our communities' experiences inform clin clinical decisions and help families advocate for their children. Since all of the SDNA Day families expressed wanting the opportunity to meet each other, and since so many of our families are interested in uh, ongoing SDNA Day research, Julianne envisioned this event as a follow-up to the Wishes for Elliot Scientific uh, Conference in April of 2015 that happened at the American Academy of Neurology. She saw the Cute Syndrome annual event as a chance for families to be able to understand the work that so many of you are doing um, and for researchers to see the faces of all of the families that their work is supporting. After a wonderful event last year, as Julianne said, where we welcomed almost 100 attendees, clinicians, researchers, and families, I have no doubt that tonight will be a wonderful evening as well. Um, and I really want to thank Julianne, who has magically left the room uh, for her vision. <laughs> so we can clap for her even though she's not here. I think Josh will accept. <laughs> um, and we also just really want to help uh, thank, we want to thank our volunteers who helped organize the event and our support group volunteers. A big thanks again to our partner organization in Brazil, 
Um, I'd also like to thank our photographer, Ryan Collard, who some of you might recognize from last year, and he's here again. Um, <laughs> uh, we'd like to thank the researchers and clinicians who have taken time away from this really busy AES event um, to support our community, and a special thanks to our speakers again and our sponsors um, for giving us the ability to expand this event from last year. Um, and finally, to the families who have traveled so far, many of you, to be here today. You are really what makes this event so special. Um, tonight, we're going to have uh, talks from researchers, and clinicians, and family members. Um, and we're going to have dinner around 7, um, so we'll break for that. Um, and I think Dianali can come up and introduce our first speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome up Andrew Tidball, please, and give a talk. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that I'm honored to be here tonight uh, and to be able to speak to all of you. Um, so today I'm going to, to talk to you about our work in modeling SCN 8A epilepsy uh, from patient-induced uh, pluripotent stem cells. Oops, I think I went the wrong direction. Ah, there we go. Okay, so this is our model system. Uh, we are using uh, patient biopsies to generate skin fibroblast cultures, and from these we are able to uh, make induced pluripotent stem cells, and from these cells we're able to differentiate into patient-specific uh, neurons. Uh, so the, these are tissues that we're not able to, uh, to get from patients, so this is a, a really neat technology that's fairly new, um, and then from these cells we're able to look at the characteristics of these neurons. So um, this is from a review from Miriam Meisler. So this shows some of the uh, mutations on the scn 8 a gene, their location. Uh, and currently, um, we've made iPS cells from six different patients with all different mutations. And the three that I'm showing here and that are in bold below are the ones that we've uh, begun to characterize to date. But we've also made iPSCs from these additional mutations. And I'd just like to thank all the uh, the parents and uh, patient donors that have contributed to this. A lot of you are here tonight. <clears throat> so these are what induced pluripotent stem cells look like. So this is just some uh, immunostaining to confirm that these truly are pluripotent stem cells. And from these cells, like I said before, we're able to generate uh, neuronal cultures. So the neurons that we've begun to um, study this disease with are deep brain uh, cortical neurons, and uh, they express some of these markers. And from these neurons, with the help of Lori Isom's lab and uh, Dr. Luis um, Lopez Santiago, we've been able to look at sodium currents in these cells, uh, since this is a, a sodium channel, uh, and it's been known from some of the other work from uh, Miriam uh, and a few other researchers that there are differences in sodium currents. So what we've seen to date, um, in at least the cells that we've worked on, we don't see a difference in the peak sodium current in uh, this small subset, but in two out of the three patients that we've looked at, we do see increases in this uh, late persistent sodium current. And that's, uh, we believe, due to impaired inactivation of the channel. And so this is quantification of all the data that we have so far. So control cells have a small amount of persistent sodium current, uh, but we do see a, a rather marked increase in patient one and patient two. And interestingly, some very new data, uh, patient six does not have this increase in persistent sodium current. And this makes sense based on uh, some of the other labs that have been modeling these different um, pathogenic mutations. There's not just um, one mechanism in this uh, in this gene leading to epileptic encephalopathy. So uh, this has a lot of implications for, um, for drugs, potentially. And uh, another thing that comes out of this with persistent sodium current is you get an increase in input resistance 
And I'm not an electrophysiologist, so I can leave that for them to explain. <laughs> so we wanted to see, do we see an increase in the amount of neuronal activity in patient cells compared to controls? And so to do that, we're using a fairly new technology. Uh, it's a multi-electrode array uh, plate where we can grow these neurons in individual wells. And in the bottom of each of these wells, there's implanted electrodes. And we can simultaneously record from all of these electrodes uh, and get um, neural activity. So each of these lines here, well, in this direction, each one of these is from an individual electrode. And then this is uh, time on the x-axis. So each of these lines is an individual action potential. So um, we've had a lot of uh, difficulty in figuring out the best way to make these neurons uh, because there's um, a lot of variability in these differentiations. But we've used a new technique that seems to be very consistent. And I won't go into the details of that right now. <clears throat> but what we see in comparing patient one to two different controls, uh, we see a very drastic increase in the amount of activity. So this is the number of the spike frequency, and this is recording over uh, a couple of weeks in culture. And so we see a, a, a huge increase in the amount of spikes in these patient cells. In addition to just the overall increase in activity, uh, we see differences in uh, bursting. So bursts of activity are, are thought to be important for um, hyperexcitability, which could lead to potentially to seizures. And so what we see in uh, both patient one and patient two, which all that data is averaged here, we see a, a big increase in the number of spikes in an individual burst of activity. Um, and this is driven mostly by a reduction in the, the time distance between these individual spikes, not an overall increase in the length of the, the burst. And this is just to exemplify what it looks like. This is data um, over about a second showing a network burst from a control individual and an SCN 8A uh, patient uh, culture. And you can see that there's a, a lot more bursts overall, and, or uh, spikes overall, and a uh, shorter time period in between. And um, Yukun uh, Yuan, another collaborator of ours from Michigan State University, he's been able to see this at the single cell level as well. So he recorded from controls and also from uh, patient one. And you can see this, the, the same difference. We see this increase in the number of spikes per burst and a, a shortening of the inner spike interval. And then also we see an increase in the number of um, spontaneously active neurons in this culture. <clears throat> so, um, we wanted to look at the not only the activity of these cells, but also the morphology. So as most of you know, NAV 1.6 is located um, primarily in the axon initial segment. That's the place where uh, it has the largest ex expression. So the axon initial segment is located here um, on the axon very close to the cell body. And this is very important for initiating action potential firing. <clears throat> and we used uh, an antibody for Ankrin G, it's, it's a label for axon initial segments. And I just showed this at a, at a conference on a poster just to show that we were getting very mature neurons because the majority of these cells had very defined axon initial segments. Interestingly enough, someone came up and said, you know, it looks like there's a big difference in the length of these axon initial segments. Um, so we went through and quantified this and it was um, a very uh, obvious difference between uh, so far patient one and patient two compared to control. And this is two different ways that we made the neurons. Uh, we, we did this in both of these techniques just to make sure it wasn't an artifact of our differentiation. So um, we kind of took a step back and thought, well, what's causing this? And if you look in the literature, when cells are hyperexcitable due to um, uh, changes in the, um, the media that they're growing in, it can lead to this shortening. So this could be a compensatory mechanism in uh, the patient cells to try to decrease the amount of activity. So currently our, our understanding of how this disease works, at least in our limited uh, study so far, is that SCN 8A missense mutations can lead in some patients, but not all, to increases in persistent sodium current, and that this leads to an increase in repetitive firing and um, an aside that, that we want to explore more uh, is this can lead to uh, responsive axon initial segment shortening. And this might also be an interesting thing to look at when we try different therapies to see if that uh, restores the normal length. 
So um, <clears throat> we're making these cultures not just to characterize uh, the mechanism, but also look at um, making a, a platform to test different uh, pharmaceutical compounds. So today, as many of you know, for uh, most patients, the best current therapy is phenytoin. But, uh, and, and this has also been shown in some, uh, some small studies that there seems to be increased specificity um, or for the, the mutant scn 8 a channel. But we wanted to compare it to another drug which hasn't been used for epilepsy but uh, inhibits um, sodium, voltage-gated sodium channels and more specifically it inhibits, it's thought to inhibit persistent sodium current uh, with some specificity. And that's called Rilizol, which actually comes from the ALS, um, treating ALS. So this is very preliminary so far, but we've been able to test what the effects of this, um, this drug and phenytoin are on the, uh, the activity in the patient cells. So on the right, th this is just to remind you the phenotypes that we saw. But you'll see that there's a reduction with, with both of these drugs in the number of spikes per burst. And this is due to a shortening of the burst duration. And um, we haven't done full uh, dose curves to look over a, a broad range, but <clears throat> just a quick literature search showed that really the, the maximum dosage that I can find that you would get in a patient without really severe side effects would be about 15 micromolar phenytoin, where really is all, um, it looks like you could get anywhere up to about three or uh, four micromolar. That might not be perfectly exact, but that seems pretty close from the literature. Uh, so these are those two wells that are bursting, control and patient, and this is what happens when you treat with uh, Rilizol. And you can see this shortening in both uh, control and patient in the length of the burst. So we think that this could be a potential therapy. It's, it's very early to say much more about it. Um, but one nice thing is this is uh, already an FDA-approved drug. So future directions, we'd like to fully characterize um, in these patients and our additional IPSC lines, uh, activation and inactivation kinetics. Uh, part of that is to look uh, beyond just persistent sodium current at what the mechanism uh, between uh, and the differences between these patients are in their sodium currents. And we also want to do the full dose response curves for these two compounds as well as some other uh, potential therapies. And we want to test to see if um, either of them has any uh, specificity for the persistent sodium current or rescues the axon initial segment length. Uh, and this is much more long-term, but we want to potentially look also in um, GABAergic inhibitory neurons just as a, a comparison. And then um, I know that there are some uh, NAD 1.6 specific drugs out there, uh, like Xenon has talked about, and we uh, could potentially test those as well. So um, I'm not the only person working on this. We have a good collaboration between um, my PI's lab, uh, Jack Parent, uh, Lori's lab, as well as uh, Yukun Yuan. I put him under her lab, but he has his own lab at Michigan State. And I'd also like to, to highlight um, my fellowship funding from Wishes for Elliot. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> okay, sorry, <laughs> no questions. <laughs> I would like to invite up uh, Maggie Nayar. Please come up. No. Hello, I'm Maggie, and this is my son Leo's story. Leo was the firstborn child of a twin pregnancy born in August 2010. At the time, I was a 35-year-old mother with placenta previa, otherwise in good health during my pregnancy. Due to placenta previa, the doctors were unable to distinguish between Braxton Hicks versus preterm labor, and for the safety, of Leo, or the babies, they performed a C-section at 36 weeks and four days. I 
I suffered postpartum hemorrhaging requiring multiple blood transfusions and emergency intervention following the delivery, but both children were safe. And Leo's twin sister, who's with us here today, is typically developing. Leo's first cousin, who was born in Greece, his father's sister's son, was born premature at 32 weeks in May 2011 and developed seizures at two months of age. He suffered seizures refractory to medicine. He experienced continuous seizure activity throughout his lifetime and passed away at 10 months. The post-mortem autopsy was unable to determine the cause of death and the genetic testing results were unremarkable. So this is Leo's twin sister who's with us here today. And this is Leo's genetic twin sister, Emma, who shares the same SCN8A variant and she's with us here today. We didn't stage this photo, this was probably taken seven years apart. That's Emma on the left and that's Leo on the left, both passengers in the red Jeep. In hindsight, after being questioned by a geneticist about whether or not we experienced any utero seizures, looking back, our SDNA day journey started at, 20, at our 20-week ultrasound. During the ultrasound, we wanted to determine the gender. Twin B was very easy to find. It was a girl. Twin A, a on the other hand, the technician had difficulty determining the sex because of too much movement, movement that the tech had never seen before. The ultrasound was stopped. The te technician went to the back to converse with the doctor. They came back and said the ultrasound looked fine, but if we, we wanted to um, find out the sex of the baby, we needed to rebook, as the baby was overly active today. Our next experience with SCN8A was at our eight months was at eight months in utero while in a movie theater. Baby A started this rhythmical contracture on my right side during a loud scene. Being my first pregnancy, I thought I was having contractures. So we timed the contractures, which lasted over a minute, and then there were no more. So I was about 32 weeks at the time. Leo's birth weight was 6.7 pounds. His APGAR scores were normal, and he was able to bottle feed successfully. Five hours following the delivery, the nurse noticed excessive jitteriness and blueness around the mouth and sent Leo to NICU for observation. So five days of extensive testing were performed. The results were interpreted as unremarkable and Leo was discharged. Two months later, we returned to ER with blueness around the mouth and in hindsight, it was a seizure. The doctor witnessed three seizures but needed an EEG to confirm the findings. The EEG was performed and was unremarkable. At this time, GERD was added to the diagnosis and a phenobarbital prescription added to see if we could control the episode. Uh, he was discharged without a definitive diagnosis. So seizures stopped for about seven days but reappeared, increasing to six times a day, always upon wakening. He was readmitted to the hospital for further evaluation. We had a lumbar puncture, MRI, extensive genetic and metabolic testing, and all were considered unremarkable. After a 24-hour EEG, a seizure was caught at two months of age, and Leo was diagnosed with a seizure disorder of unknown cause. Between two to 11 months of age, seizures were poorly controlled. Phenobarbital was always in therapeutic range, but never therapeutic. Clobazam was added, but never helped. So due to, to, due to poor seizure control, a new anti-seizure medication, Keppra, was added, and it took on a life of its own. It triggered a quasi-status where Leo was not completely unconscious, but was unable to get into a deep sleep cycle and suffered continuous seizures. Seizures increased to hundreds a day, accompanied with inconsolable crying, and in addition, his extremities were paralyzed in bilateral contractures. Three year visits later, and several phenobarb loads later, things got worse. IV phosphenitone was finally administered in ER. Leo stabilized and finally fell asleep into a deep sleep, sleeping 12 hours, probably the first time he got some sleep in about a month. His hands finally released as he stopped seizing. We completely removed the Keppra 
and Topamax was added. Before Kepra, Leo could sit. Before Kepra, Leo could talk. And before Kepra, Leo could clap his hands. After Kepra, Leo relearned how to sit, but Leo has not relearned how to talk, and Leo has not relearned how to clap his hands. After Kepra, Leo was given Topamax. While on Topamax, Leo went nearly a year without tonic-clonic seizures, but still had several breakthrough partials, which we were in denial about. During the year, we, um, he made developmental gains, like taking his first steps and communicating using his assistive communication device. And then in December 2012, Leo's seizures returned, and he was unable to gain control for um, six months. During this time, he was also diagnosed with SCN8A epilepsy. We got a referral to the ketogenic clinic. We maxed out on Topamax, phenobarbital, and increased clobazam with no significant seizure control. So for six months, Leo experienced repetitive cycles, which included seizure, vomiting, postictal fever, seizure, then we would head to the ER for a visit, IV phosphenotone load was given, and then he would have a honeymoon phase with seizure relief between one to two weeks, maybe three, and then the cycle would repeat again. So with Leo, it was all or nothing. Once the seizure started, Leo was unable to return to baseline without IV phosphenatolin load, and Ativan at home made things worse. In May 2013, we started the ketogenic diet while being on a wait list for five months. The benefits of the M he's actually on the medium chain triglyceride ketogenic diet. Uh, the benefits were improved seizure control. We no longer required rescue meds or ER visits. Leo was able to return to baseline on his own, and this lasted for two and a half years. During our last SCN 8A family gathering in December 2015, Leo's seizures started to ramp up and seized daily for three days while I was here at the conference. We tweaked his ketogenic diet with no improvement. In January 2016, the seizures got worse. It was his first seizure-related ER visit in two and a half years since starting the ketogenic diet with a cluster of eight partial seizures. The rescue med this time was a fat bomb. In ER, the keto team added a large amount of fat of 12.5 grams of base cell margarine twice daily, just the margarine, not the, but not the bread, and it stopped the clusters and Leo remained seizure-free for a week. My take-home point from the SCNA gathering last year was that you start with the meds that you know work for SCN8A. Given Leo's history of repetitive seizure cycles and the fact that tweaking the keto diet no, was no longer providing long-term seizure relief, I asked for Leo to be started on a sodium channel blocker. We started Trileptal and Leo had immediate success. Leo has had less seizures this year than that one day in ER back in January. Leo experienced a few breakthrough seizures while trying to wean phenobarbital, but we believe that trileptal being too low is why we saw breakthroughs. Since then, we've increased Leo's trileptal levers, levels during our last wean, and he did not experience any seizures. Leo is regaining skill again. He is starting to stand, he's using his walker, he's learning how to read, write, and loves core patterning within the math curriculum with basic addition and subtraction. He is homeschooled plus attends conductive education four days a week and performs extensive neuro rehab 12 hours a week. But most importantly, he's the happiest person I know. And my daughter said, I'm the happiest person that you know. So you, with twins, you always have to stay there too. I often wonder, I often wonder what would have happened if Leo was diagnosed with SCN8A during his 20-week ultrasound, or you, even during his eighth month, my eighth month of pregnancy when I felt his first seizure. Could we have figured out a way to start off with a sodium channel blocker while I was pregnant? Could we have started Leo on a sodium channel blocker the minute he was born? Could we have tried a sodium channel blocker instead of Kepra at 11 months of age? I often wonder, 
When IV phosphenitone was successful, why didn't we start on a sodium channel blocker at that time? But instead, we waited for six months for the keto diet. Many gains have been made since Leo started his journey. Life keeps getting better, and I'm more hopeful than ever that we can continue making progress in this small group. Thank you. I would like to now welcome up uh, Manaj Patel. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to come up and talk about my work, but uh, I want to acknowledge that there's quite a few labs here that actually do very similar work. And so there's Andrew's lab, there's Laurie's lab, there's Jack Perrin's lab, Miriam's lab, and uh, Ted Cummings' lab. So, that, so uh, if this is just a little bit of what I'm doing, but together we're really um, you know, understanding a lot more about this disease. So, so we're, we're really grateful that there's a lot of people doing this, uh, doing this work right now. Just check out how it works. Okay, so. So we're all talking about sodium channels because these patients have mutations in the sodium channel. So before we do that, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about what the sodium channel does. So the sodium channel is in the membrane and it's really important for controlling the activity of neurons, okay? So seizures happen because these neurons become overactive. So under normal conditions, when the cell is quiet, um, you can see that the channel is closed and the sodium ions don't come through. When you want to excite that neuron, and they're happening all the time, that's how you talk, that's how you see, that's how you, how you uh, listen, the channel opens and sodium ions come through. Under normal conditions, the sodium ion then closes and sodium ions don't come through anymore. But we know that there are a number of mutations in the sodium channel that, make, that disrupts this normal process. So these are just some of the mutations that are out there. We know there's a lot more, and they're all over the place. But the gain-of-function mutations lead to the, to the fact that basically the channel somehow doesn't inactivate properly. So what you get is a continuation of that sodium ion coming through. And if you look here, the red line shows you the persistent current that Andrew was talking about. And that's enough to drive these neurons to be, to be continually active and therefore give you, give you seizures. So we've been very fortunate that Miriam actually made a, a knock-in mouse model of Shea's mutation. Shea's mutation was right here. She made this mouse model, and the mouse has seizures, and the mouse also experiences SUDEP. And we're also very fortunate that Miriam was giving that mouse out to a lot of us so that we could actually continue working on this mouse. So a lot of folks out there are working on this mouse, and we're learning more and more about this uh, disease because Miriam has uh, made this mouse available to a lot of folks. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing over the last year with my team, and that's really trying to understand the mechanisms of um, the seizures in this, in this mouse. And we focused on one particular area, which is in the hippocampus. I know that Laurie's working in the cortex, and other folks are working on other areas, and eventually when we get all this information together, we'll, we'll have a better idea of uh, what could be going on. So we looked at these mice at three weeks because we can have uh, mice that have one copy of the gene, of the mutated gene, which is what the patients have, and we can also make mice that have two copies of the gene. And if you have two copies of the gene, the mice start seizing at three weeks old. If you have one copy, they don't seize for about 12 weeks, okay? So if you look at one of the litter mates, the wild type mates, what you can see is if you excite this neuron um, and you continue to excite it, they start to have these spikes. And Andrew talked a little bit about these spikes, but that's telling you that the neuron is becoming hyperexcitable or excitable. So under normal conditions, you want these neurons to fire. That's how we speak, talk, and think. However, if you look at these mice that have this mutation, what you can see, and this is, this is a mouse that has just one copy, you can see that when it shouldn't be firing, it really is firing, okay? They're called action potentials. But this means that this mouse has overactive neurons. If you make that plot, you can see that this mouse is having action potentials when the control, a lot more action potentials, shall I say, than the control mouse, okay? So this is what is the hallmark of seizures. If you have two copies of it, you can see that, uh, again, it also fires at these uh, stimulation intensities when wild type don't, and you get the same effect. What's interesting here is that these mice are actually about to seize and have pseudep. These mice are still a month or two away from having seizures. 
So this is telling you that these neurons that we're looking at are already becoming hyperexcitable and are ready to, to have seizures, but the rest of the network most likely isn't ready yet. And it doesn't get ready for about another month. So this is important in understanding what parts of the brain are starting to change um, just before seizure onset. There is a point when, when we stimulate them, they all can have the same number of spikes. So they have the same level of activity. But if you look carefully, you can see that they go up and go down very quickly in wild type, but these seem to be slightly different. They look different. When you start to look at the very first spike in each of these, you can see that the control comes up and comes back down. That's, that's normal. But the ones that have the mutated copy, either one or two copies, look very different. They're much wider. And this is important because this is now making these neurons continue to be more active. If we look at the second and third spike, so here this is one, two, and three, you can see in, in the wild type mice, they're very similar and that's again normal. But here, the first one is wide, but the second and third one is getting even wider, okay? And that's again showing you that these neurons are just abnormal. They actually continue to be excitable when they really should not be, uh, they should be going back down here. Now we know that within the brain it's a network, okay, so it's all these neurons are talking to each other and when they do this, this is how we're able to, um, you know, communicate. So you have one neuron here that talks to this neuron and this neuron then talks to this neuron and that's also the way that the seizures can spread throughout the brain. So we wanted to have a look to see if there were any differences in the way that these neurons communicated with each other or talked to each other. And we can do that by exciting them. We can stimulate parts of the brain and then look to see what's happening. So we stimulated some neurons that were upstream of this, the one we were looking at. And what you can see is if you stimulate them, you get a spike. That means that this neuron was active. If you increase that intensity to make them spike more, under wild type mice, in wild type mice, we can't do that. So we, we, we turned it up twofold and threefold, and they just continue to have one little spike. If you do that in the mouse that has the mutation, you can see that you can make the neuron fire more spikes. What this means is, is that that particular neuron is likely to continue to talk to the next neuron and so on and so forth, and this could be a mechanism by which these seizures are starting. And of course, if you have two copies, it's a lot worse. You get three spikes and four spikes. And if you look at the duration, so the time of this, this response, it's much wider here than it is here. These come back down to baseline, and these continue to, 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 to be more active. And we saw Andrew's traces of sodium channel currents, and so we did similar recordings, and you can see in wild type, the channel's open and then they inactivate. Remember I told you that one of the mechanisms is that this inactivation is impaired, and so you, you're left with what they call a persistent current. That's the current there in red. And if you look at these three, you can see that they're very different. Look out here in wild type, there's no, there really isn't much of a, um, a difference between the, the top line and the bottom line, but here you can see this is, this is wider, this is bigger. And that is really the persistent current. And this seems to be a common theme for a lot of the gain-of-function mutations. Many of them have this, what they call, persistent non-inactivating uh, current. So there's the, the black line is control, and the sort of channel should just be quiet now, which this black line is showing you. It's back to baseline. But these mutated channels continue to open or chatter. And that will drive that neuron to become more active. It will make it fire more spikes, and that will then keep the circuit going. So I told you that the mouse was, um, the, the mouse at three weeks doesn't seize for another month or so, and so we looked at mice that were actually seizing at nine weeks, and we can start to see that there are some changes in these neurons that we're looking at, which means that the, the networks, the brain is changing to the point where it's now going to start having seizures. And this is important because if we're going to start trying to mess around and try and correct this, we could, we've got a time frame with these mice to, in which we can, we can explore this idea. So the other thing that my lab is doing, because this mouse is so valuable, is to start looking at anticonvulsant drugs. Um, and really it was the paper that came out a while ago that said that phenytoin was useful in these patients. In at least four patients, they found that uh, they had this remarkable sensitivity to phenytoin. So O'Brien is my grad student. He's sitting at the back over there. And in collaboration with Miriam Meisler, we looked at the effects of phenytoin on, a, on, a, on an SCN8A mutation, that's 1327B. And we characterized the mutation, and it had the typical hallmarks of a, of a gain-of-function mutation. And we wanted to see what phenytoin was doing. And um, I just want to point also that the Xenon folks have been doing a lot of this with their compounds and, and some of the anticonvulsant drugs, and they've done a, a, a very um, um, extensive study on the mutations. What we found was, if you look at phenytoin on wild-type channels, 
That's the normal channel. And the fact that that's smaller in the presence of phenytoin means that the channel is being blocked, which is what you want to do with an anticonvulsant. What you can see here is that the block is more. Okay, so this, this little peak here is, is, is much smaller than the blue line, which means that phenytoin under these conditions had a greater effect on this mutation than it did on the wild type. And this is not that surprising for people who, who um, understand the biophysical properties of the channel. These channels are behaving in a way that the anticonvulsant drugs are likely to block them more, because these drugs are what they call state-dependent blockers. So, but it's a nice study to show that perhaps um, with this mutation, phenytoin may be useful. And it turns out that in the study, there's two patients that had this mutation, and in one of the patients, I've got one minute, in one of the patients, uh, phenytoin was useful. Um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. We're also looking in Miriam's mice to see what the effects of anticonvulsant drugs are, because I don't think we really know which drugs are effective and which ones are not. And we want to try Keppra because we think it's going to make it worse. But phenytoin works in these mice. Carbamazepam also works in this mice, in these mice too. We're also working on 1.6 selective blockers too, and we're, we're grateful to Xenon who are helping us with this. This is a collaborator of mine in Italy who's made a series of compounds. We have three that we think are 1.6 selective, and Xenon are helping us to screen some of these compounds. And we're going to look at future experiments is to actually start trying to knock down the channel. And we can do this in the mouse. Um, we, can, we can get viruses that have all the nasty parts taken out, so we can then put in um, what they call SHRNAs, which will start knocking down the channel. We can do this by injecting the virus into mice, into regions that we think are important. The green neurons are the neurons that are now infected with the, uh, with the virus. We can start to record, and if we do that under normal conditions, we can start making these spikes go down, which is what we want to do. We can look at some of the sodium channel currents and show that these currents are getting smaller, which is what we want to achieve. We also are trying to figure out where these seizures are starting in these mice because we don't know where to target. They probably start at different places all the time. But we're looking at genes that get activated after a seizure, and we're now starting to figure out which areas we might want to start putting this virus into. And I'd like to acknowledge my team. This is my lab, Matteo, Brian, and Ron, and Miriam and JC, who have provided the mice and my funding. Thank you. So we're just going to um, amend the agenda slightly. So dinner is here and it's ready. If we can have the professionals all gather, um, start getting in line to make your place, we're going to have the families get together for a group photo as the professionals are getting their dinner started. Um, and then we'll move this next speaker to just after dinner. So thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Brittany Falls and I am Jake's mom. Uh, my Jake was the most recent loss uh, to this terrible disorder that uh, all of us, uh, all of you attending the meeting uh, in some way are affiliated with or have been directly affected by. Um, Julianne asked me to say just a few words to all of you regarding how I feel as an SCN8A mom who now is on the other side of this horrible disorder. And uh, having been on both sides of the fence, um, on the side that uh, you are on and now on the side that no longer has my child with me anymore. I can say that I have felt uh, um, every feeling that you have ever felt uh, and even more so uh, possibly than many of you. My son Jake was one of the most severely affected by this horrible disorder uh, and due to his SCN8A mutation uh, at about 14 months of age, uh, Jake developed early infantile epileptic encephalopathy, uh, to which probably all of you 
know what a devastating diagnosis that is. Uh, due to the uh, encephalopathy, my Jake uh, went from being extremely happy, vibrant, um, wonderful little boy who had delays and who um, was making milestones, although with delays, um, to a completely lifeless, comatose, unresponsive um, one-year-old little boy that had absolute no, bil no abilities whatsoever. Uh, he lived that way for about a, uh, just a little over a year. Uh, we tried every single sodium channel blocker drug available. We tried CBD oil. Um, a um, VNS was an option, but uh, once my Jake got too fragile, uh, he was too medically unstable. So uh, surgery was not an option. He developed chronic lung disease um, due to the multiple seizures every day and ultimately respiratory issues is what took him away from me. Um, to um, all the families that are there, I'm so happy that you are getting to meet one another and attend. Uh, I wish that I could be there to meet you in person, although I'm thankful to have this opportunity to talk with you in this manner. But um, I, I want to say keep holding on and savor every moment and um, don't worry, don't, you know, don't worry about uh, what you've lost uh, don't worry about what your child is not doing and focus on everything that they are and they they are able to do um, and take this life one day at a time because I can tell you from experience how precious every moment is um, to the doctors researchers clinicians um, I want you to know just how important your work is and how much we really do appreciate all the hard work that you are putting into trying to help our children and I hope that future children future families never have to face the hardships that my family has had to face uh, I hope that future children never have to suffer in the way that my son has suffered and I hope that future families can keep their children much much longer than three years and eight days which is all that the good Lord allowed me to have with my son Jake um, I'm very thankful that I was given three years but it was it was not enough and it's never enough and with more research with better treatment options with uh, early diagnosis with uh, the right medications and treatments and aggressive doctors and parents working together to help our children. I do believe that the future can be much brighter for our SCN8A children and their families. Um, I wrote up in detail a um, summary of my Jake's life and the trials that we faced that I gave to Gabrielle. Uh, so if you did not attend her meeting and you're interested in knowing more details about what we faced um, in our three years, uh, um, I encourage you to talk with her and I'm sure that she could give you a print of that. But uh, again, thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you today, and, um, and good luck. Hang in there, and God bless. And realizing the extraordinary challenges that, that you go through. And what I've done is um, I've decided to make this talk in a language that I hope, hopefully you'll understand. That if I use words that you don't understand, please stop me, and I'll make sure that uh, I explain things. Um, so this talk really is dedicated to all of you courageous uh, parents who you know, live with this condition day and night and you're back with. And so what I'm hoping to do is really explain to you what we're doing at Xenon Pharmaceuticals in terms of developing 
novel therapeutic agents that are highly selective, targeting the specific problem. And this is really the, the way Xenon focuses in developing therapeutics in this era where we, what we talk about is precision medicine targeting the very specific root cause of disease. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm a clinician, I'm actually a medical geneticist. And my role at Xenon is I'm in charge of doing the clinical trials. And um, I'm, I'm also play a big role in helping the, what we call the non clinical group, the group that develops the compounds, the drugs, helping them to transition those into my groups, my department's uh, role in bringing these drugs to the patients. So what I'm going to do today is tell you, make sure everyone understands what, what the genetic basis of this condition is. So the background will be really talking about the genetics, so you make sure everyone really understands what a gene is. And then I'm going to tell you, use an example of pain. Now I know tonight you've not come here to listen to a story about pain, but I've got six slides. And it's a very interesting story. And the reason I want to tell you about pain and the genetics around pain is because the underlying cause of people who don't feel pain or people who feel too much pain is a genetic basis and it's also a sodium channel defect. And we've worked extensively in this area. I'd like to show you how it will apply and draw analogies between the story around pain and the story around epilepsy. I won't spend too much time, but if you'll bear with me as we go through this, I think you'll realize that there's a lot to be learned. And we'll also speak to the capability that Xenon has to be able to address the challenges that we all face in trying to treat patients with gamma function SCMA today. So please bear with me when we get to that session. So then after that, I'll talk about um, the challenges in developing drugs for sodium channels some of the specific challenges in developing drugs for epilepsy that relate to the sodium channels. And then I'm going to tell you about how Xenon's actually tackling the problem, and then the challenges going forward from where we are today. So please bear with me. I do have a little bit longer than some of the other speakers, but I will try to keep this to you know, 20, 25 minutes. So please feel free to interrupt me if I'm not talking a language that you guys understand. So the background. So I have to put up the statement because I am a part of the, the company. You don't have to read that. That just means I'm a shareholder in the company that I'm talking about, which is Xenon Pharmaceutical. So Xenon is a company that we're based on the west coast of Canada in Vancouver. And what we do is we use human genetics to define critical targets for treating diseases. And we've got a very strong capability in genetics and in developing drugs, all within the, the Xenon boundaries. So we study rare inherited disorders and then we use the underlying genetic architecture to define how we're going to develop the drugs. So it's really a precision type medicine that we practice and are trying to develop therapeutics for at Xenon. So now I want to make sure we all understand what we mean when we talk about a gene. So we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes, the 46 chromosomes all in all, and there are about 20,000 genes that are held on these chromosomes. And that means there's billions you can see there are 3.3 billion of these base pairs that have coding information that determine everything about us. So genes are the genetic information. They're the blueprint for everything about us. So whether we're tall, whether we're short, whether we have blue eyes or green eyes, it's all in the information within the gene, the blueprint for who we are. And, of course, it also determines whether we evolve and develop in a normal fashion. And if there's a change in a gene, a change in a gene we refer to as a mutation, if there's a mutation, then this means that potentially, not all mutations are deleterious, not all mutations cause problems, but potentially, if there's a change in a gene, it can lead to a disease. So, as I said, the genes are code for all the information. It's, you can think of it as an instruction manual for who you are. So when you hear this fancy word genome, and you hear about whole genome scanning, it means looking at the totality of the information in all of our genetics. So you can think of that as the whole book. That's the genome. And then if you want to break it down and take this analogy further, when you think of chromosomes, these are each of the chapters in the book. So there'll be 46 chapters, 23 pairs of chromosomes, one chromosome from each of our parents. And then you can see the sentences, which really read the information, would be equivalent in this analogy that I'm drawing to the genes themselves. So the sentences actually hold the information, and they have to make sense. So if there's something wrong in the information, the sentence won't make sense. And so, for example, if the information was, and this is just a, a line I made up, the gray cat ran down the hall. That's the original 
You can picture this grey cat running down the hall. But if you have a change, can I point you? Oh gosh, that wasn't clever. <laughs> what I do now, oh there, okay. What do you do, press this one? Oh, should I keep pressing different buttons? Hope for the best. Oh, underneath here. The up button. There we go. Thank you. Thanks. So, we've got this gray cat running down the hall. That's the original statement. Now, if you see a change from H to a B, that would mean a single amino acid has changed, and you can see it no longer makes sense, this gray cat running down the ball. That's what we call a mid-sense mutation. So just one amino acid has been swapped in. Now, the problem is, this clearly doesn't make sense, but what if we changed the A to an E? That's also a change of an amino acid, but it's still a gray cat. So not all mid-sense mutations lead to a deleterious change. So it would still be a gray cat. It's just spelled differently. And that's the challenge that we have when we're dealing with mid-sense mutations. And most of what we're talking about tonight with SCN8A gain of function, these are mid-sense mutations. Other mutations that can occur is you can insert a bit of an extra piece, the gray-green cat. You can remove something. There's a gray ran down the hall. Obviously, these are complete loss of information, loss of function. So when we talk about loss of function, it means that the protein that's coded by this particular gene no longer does the job it's supposed to do. And the opposite is gain of function where it's doing too much of what it's supposed to do. And I've actually got some slides, some cartoons to explain this. And then you can see you can have duplication. And then this is a, a very common change, what we call a stop codon. So all of a sudden, it stops reading the information and just stops getting its track. So all you've got here is the gray, which makes absolutely no sense. So it's another loss of function. Okay. Now, if you'll bear with me, as I said, I'm going to tell you the story about pain. And it is a very interesting story, and then I'll show you how this illuminates the path for going forward with epilepsy itself. So, it's a very innovative approach. I'm sure all of you can recognize this as Leonardo da Vinci's flying machine that he predicted in the 16th century. And that's us in the modern era tinkering with genes and trying to be as innovative as he was back in the 16, in 1500s. So, the story starts with this remarkable observation that we made at Xenon is that there are very rare patients who experience absolutely no pain whatsoever. So you can burn these patients, you can break their bones. This particular guy used to go, uh, be at a fair and he stick these needles into him and he felt he didn't perceive any pain whatsoever. So we reasoned that if we could identify the underlying cause for this particular remarkable phenotype, this remarkable clinical picture of an inability to perceive pain, this would catapult us into novel pathways for therapeutic development. And that's exactly what we did. We found these patients, very rare patients, and identified the underlying gene, which turns out to be a sodium channel. Hopefully that's the next slide. Here it is. So I'm pointing with this. So this is a picture of a sodium channel. And it turns out it's a very closely related sodium channel. It's called NAV 1.7. So when NAV 1.7 is broken, when it's got a loss of function, one of those mutations that made no sense, then it leads to an inability for this channel to conduct the sodium current and patients, despite a noxious stimulus, despite burning them and breaking the bones, they don't feel any pain. So this is the loss of function. And just to make sure everyone knows what we mean by channel, and you've heard a lot about channels, but really the simple way to think about it is think about it as a gate. And through this gate goes a message. So this message over here, this would be your sodium coming through the channel, coming through the gate. So just think of a channel as a gate. And there's a message that needs to go through. Now the problem is, so these messages lead to the nerve impulse. So sodium channels are involved in initiating the impulse and propagating the impulse along the neuron, along the nerve. Now the problem is, if you have a mutation, sometimes you don't make this particular channel. The channel's broken, it's what we call a loss of function. Or the channel is locked, you can't open up. So the message can't get through. The sodium can't be conducted through this particular channel. And that's what we refer to loss of function. Now, what's most important to us tonight is exactly the opposite, which is gain of function. But I did want to explain to you the loss of function because it just highlights the contrast to get a good appreciation of the loss of function. So what can happen is this particular gate can also be made in, ab in an abnormal fashion and it can be stuck. You can have, for example, a, a block over here, so the gate's wide open. Or you can make too many of these gates, or the gates are too readily opening up. 
And so the net effect is you've got too much of this message passing through the gate, and so you have too much of the sodium current being passed through. And actually, when you think about pain, there's a, a, a condition called erythromyalgia, which is this devastating condition where patients who don't have a noxious stimulus feel like they have a, a really bad, for example, they feel like their hands are on fire because these channels are open and they're firing away, they're conducting the sodium current. When there's a slight increase in the room temperature, they feel it as though they've been put inside a fire. And the reason is these channels are hyper-excitable. And this is what's most analogous, most similar to what's going on in SE and A. There's a gain of function, hyper-excitability of these channels. And that's similar to what's happening in the hyper-excitability which underlies the epilepsy in SE8A gain of function. So th these are missense mutations. And I'm going to show you what we've been able to do here in pain. One patient, one example. So we've developed therapeutics, drugs that specifically block NAV 1.7. And we've taken a patient with erythromyalgia. So remember, these are patients when you the heat, we put them in the slightest bit of heat. This massively induces the pain. Would just be a little bit of heat for you and I, but for them, it sharply triggers pain. I'm going to show you when we've treated these patients, and this is one example, with a specific NAV 1.7 inhibitor, how we can completely block the ability to induce pain. So what you're looking at here is this patient, we did it for two days, here's day one and here's day two. And the patient in a blinded fashion, we did what's called a double blind placebo controlled trial. That means the patient didn't know what they were getting, the physicians treating them didn't know what they were getting at the time of treating them, and they got both the active and the placebo for two days each. And you can see the placebo is in orange and the active is in green. And zero means they have no pain, 10 means it's the worst pain that they can imagine. And this is day one and this is day two. And you can see the, 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 line, the vertical lines of here is every time we put them in front of the heater. And when they were on placebo, you can see they go from a very low amount of pain, one means it's very minimal pain. As you can see, we were rapidly able to induce them to a seven, which is pretty severe pain. We then take away the heat stimulus, and on the placebo, they take about two hours to come down to normal. Did it again in the afternoon. We really tortured these patients. They were willing to do it. And then in the afternoon, same thing. Second day, exactly the same thing. Six inductions of, uh, with heat, each time on placebo able to do this. By the afternoon of the second day when they're getting the, the green represents the active, you can see despite a very much broader, we put the heater much closer to them. We could barely induce the pain. We could only get them to a two. On the morning of the second day on the active, despite a very robust heat induction stimulus, our drugs blocking that 1.7 completely block the ability to, to induce pain in these patients, showing that by blocking the gain of function in this particular condition, you can completely reverse the, the severe disease that these patients have. And that's what we want to do and are going to be doing with SC and ATA gain of function. So just to tell you about some of the challenges we have in doing this for epilepsy, something about sodium channels that are really important. And I think you appreciate that there are multiple sodium channels in the human body. There's sodium channels in skeletal muscle. And of course, you don't want to inhibit these because you breathe with your, skeletal, with your muscles. There are channels in the heart, NAV 1.5. There are specific genetic conditions when NAV 1.5 isn't working properly. We don't want to inhibit these either because that can lead to arrhythmias and potentially even death if we were to block these channels inappropriately. And then, of course, you've heard about other channels, pain, and then, of course, the NAV 1.6 channels you're very familiar with. There's also a channel called NAV 1.1, which is the channel that, when it's lost its function, leads to Dravet syndrome. So we don't want to block that channel either because that leads to more of an epilepsy-type phenotype. So we really want to more specifically block the NAV 1.6 and not any of these other channels if possible. But this is a challenge because these channels are very, very similar to each other. And so we had to find a way, and my Xenon colleagues who did all this work were able to find a specific way to target these NAV 1.6 channels and not these other channels. But this is the first challenge. But there's additional challenges when you're developing sodium channel blockers. This is just a cartoon to show you what the sodium channel looks like. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it does speak to you a little bit later on how my Xenon colleagues were able to specifically develop a NAV 1.6 uh, inhibitor. So this is the... Um, the membrane of the nerve, and the channel, as you can see, goes back and forth through the membrane. 
And each time it goes through, we call this a transmembrane segment because it's going across the membrane. And you can see it's broken up into four parts, D1 to D4. And each of these D stands for domain. So four regions, four domains. And each domain contains six transmembrane regions, six regions that are going back and forth across the membrane. And each of these regions has a specific role. So this part, five and six, where you see five and six in each domain, what actually happens is you're looking at now in a flat one dimension, but really what it does is it curls around to form a pore. So regions five and six transmembrane regions contribute to form the pore. So what we have here is a crystal structure of this one dimensional picture, and you can see these pore forming domains have come together and surrounded to form that central canal through which the sodium channel is conducted. And then surrounding it are what we call these VSDs, which stands for voltage sensing domain. And this senses the voltage across the plasma membrane, which determines where the channel is going to open or be closed and allow the transmission of the sodium current or not. So that's just what uh, the sodium channel looks like. And as you can appreciate, and I'm sure all of you know from a lot of experience with some of these sodium channel blockers, because they're so ubiquitously expressed, when you use a drug that is non-selective, that blocks more than one of these channels, that doesn't specifically block the desirable channel, you're going to have a lot of target-related side effects, being other sodium channel targets, as well as off-target related effects. So the big challenge with the current sodium channel blockers that are on the market, such as, for example, phenytoin, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, just to show you a couple of examples, they each have a whole slew of adverse events that can occur with these particular sodium channel blockers. And of course, the goal is to develop therapeutics that not only are efficacious, but have a limited repertoire of adverse events that can occur. So I'm just going to show you one painting. This is a painting by Johannes Vermeer. And many of you will have heard of the, or and seen the painting called A Woman with a Pearl Earring. That's by the same um, artist. He was a Dutch artist, and this was painted in the 1600s, I think 1663. And what I want you to focus on is the balance. See, there's a very fine balance of here. It's pretty symmetrical. And I want you to remember this picture because it's critical for understanding what goes on with sodium channels. It's not just one sodium channel acting on its own. In fact, there's a whole network of sodium channels. And there are two critical channels that determine whether an impulse is going to be conducted. And that's NAV 1.1 and NAV 1.6. And they work in a counter fashion. NAV 1.6, so there's a fine balance between NAV 1.6 and NAV 1.1. And you can remember it by remembering it that Vermeer painting, that critical fine balance. And what 1.6 does, it's the accelerator. It drives the nerve impulse. It wants to go. And if you think of taking the car analogy further, NAV 1.1 of the brakes. It puts the, the brake on the impulse going. And as you can see, in the normal situation, they're nicely balanced. So these are what we call excitatory, the driving neuron. And these are the inhibitory. And they work together to have a fine balance. In Dravet syndrome, we have lots of function of NAV 1.1. NAV 1.1 neurons, the inhibitory neurons, the brakes are no longer working. So this is defective in Dravet syndrome. And what that means is the excitatory neurons are just free to run loose, and you have this hyper-excitability state which underlies the epilepsy and Dravet syndrome. In, a, in SCN8A gain-of-function mutations, the NAV1.1 is actually doing just fine. It's normal, but you have excessive hyperactivity. There's overactivity of the SCN8A of the NAV1.6. So when I say SCN8A, that's the gene which codes for NAV1.6, which is the channel. I should have told you that at the beginning. I'm sorry. So you have overactivity of the NAV1.6 channel. And of course, we all know that when you give sodium channel blockers, the non-selective sodium channel blockers to Dravet syndrome, you don't want to be inhibiting this because it's already suppressed. And that's exactly why drugs like lamotrigine make patients with Dravet syndrome worse, because you're inhibiting the, the break. So you're not only inhibiting the target the um, excitatory neurons, you're also inhibiting the brakes, and that's why some patients get worse. And similarly, for the gain of function patients, you do not want to be inhibiting the NAV 1.1. You just want to inhibit specifically the 1.6 neurons that are hyperactive. And here's just a, a slide showing you how important it is to have this balance. And these are mice with Dravet syndrome. And mice with Dravet syndrome, this is SEN1A, 
um, you can see it by this nomenclature over here. You can see this is the percent of animals that survive up to 125 days. By 125 days, they all are deceased, these animals. And when you introduce a loss of function, SEN8A mutation, into these Dravet mice, this complete reversal of that phenotype. So you're restoring that balance, and they no longer die. So this shows you how critical it is to have a fine balance between NAV 1.1 and NAV 1.6. So now, I'm not going to really talk to you about SE and ATA. I think most everyone in this room understands the nature of this phenotype and has had a lot of experience understanding the clinical picture. We do know that it's due to what we refer to heterozygous. Heterozygous means it's just one of the genes. We inherit a gene from each parent. Just one of the genes has mutated, has changed into one of these into a mutant allele, a mutant gene, and it's almost always, not absolutely always, almost always a de novo, meaning a new mutation that leads to a change and a gain of function in the SCN8 leading to an enhanced function of the NAV1.6 channel. And it's very different to Dravet syndrome, which is triggered by fever, the, epi the, the, the seizures. In SCN8 gain of function, fever doesn't appear to be a triggering factor. There are multiple seizure types that you're all aware of, and there can be a significant impact on development and cognition. Um, so generally, as you know, there's huge, huge challenges with treating uh, patients, but some patients have responded moderately well to the non-selective sodium channel blockers. And here's just a, a summary table. I don't expect you to try and read this. Again, showing you the, uh, the channel, and each dot represents a different mutation. But what's clear from this channel is that not all of these mutations are gain of function. So some of these ones, the open circles, actually represent a loss of function, and they present in a different way. So even though they are de novo, they're new mutations, these can present with uh, intellectual disability and not necessarily a epileptic seizure type phenotype. And then this is work from uh, Dr. Maria Meister's laboratory where they've really characterized at the molecular level what's going on. Remember I showed you those earlier cartoons about what a gain of function looks like when you look at the channel. You see the gates are more open or there are more of those gates letting through the messages. And this is the more detailed electrophysiological explanations where the channels are opening prematurely when they shouldn't be opening, so more sodium current is going through, or they don't close properly, that's what we refer to as impaired inactivation, they don't switch off, they don't inactivate, or, and you've heard a lot about this word, persistent current, this is wild type, that means in a normal person, you get this peak current, this current, this large current over here, which quickly comes back down to normal, there's a small amount, about 1% of this current, which persists, that's why it's called the persistent current, 1% of that compared to this level over here. In sen 8 a gain of function, here's an example with this particular mutation. You can see the peak current's reduced, and there's a much larger persistent current, and that appears to be also another reason for gain of function in patients with sen 8 a epilepsy. So this results in neurons that are firing excessively, hyperexcitable neurons, and this is the basis for the epilepsy, when these neurons are firing when they shouldn't be firing. So, of course, the answer is to block these hyperexcitable neurons, to block this, the NAV1.6 channels, and as I've stressed to you, it needs to be done in a selective way to not lead to the adverse effects of blocking the other sodium, very closely related sodium channels. So now, sorry, this should be the tackling the problem. So what have we done to... So just to restate the problem, I think I've, I've made it clear, but I'll just state it again, that there are sodium channel inhibitors that are pretty useful anti-epileptics, but they're not, they're not selective sodium channel blockers. And NAV1.1, um, likely, um, an ambition of NAV1.1 is likely the concern when we use these non-selective blockers, because we don't want to be inhibiting NAV1.1, because that leads to more of an epilepsy type phenotype. And of course, we don't want to inhibit NAV1.5 because that's a cardiac channel. So the solution is very obvious. What we need to do is block 1.6 and spare the blocking NAV1.1 and NAV1.5. Don't block those at all. And that was the challenge that the Xenon Discovery team was faced with and took up that challenge. And I want to show you that we've been successful in developing highly selective NAV1.6 uh, sodium channel blockers. So going from the genes to the therapies. 
So again, we come back to this cartoon of the sodium channel, and this is the crystal structure of the sodium channel in its folded dimension. And many of the non-selective sodium channels bind in a region that's not different between the different sodium channels. So in other words, they'll bind to any sodium channel. There's nothing select about them. But the xenon scientists were able to identify, so understanding the crystal structure and doing what's called computational chemistry, so just all in silica, understand which regions were the best to target and to develop specific molecules, first in silica, that means through the computational methodology, but then they were able to make these, actually synthesize these compounds and show first in vitro, that means in, in a cell culture system, and then in vivo, and I'm going to show you these data in a minute, that it, we actually are achieving remarkable selectivity, blocking only the one six and not the other sodium channels. So um, please ignore this on this slide over here. It doesn't actually belong on the slide because I'm just showing you in vitro data and that's in vivo data that's going to appear on the next slide. I'm sorry about that. So what you see here is four different drugs. Phenytoin, which you're familiar with, is a non-selective sodium channel blocker. And we've got three different xenon drugs. And as you go from here to here, this is the IC50, which is the inhibitory concentration, which talks about the potency. And the smaller the number means less drug you need to inhibit this channel. So the smaller the number, the more potent it is. And you can see this particular one, this is our most potent compound in this particular set of drugs that I'm showing you, has many folds more potent than the current phenytoin. Now, what we also want is selectivity. And the larger the number over here, so here we're comparing that 1.6 block to the block on 1.1, and here you want a larger number. The higher the number means the greater the degree of selectivity. And we particularly want this when we compare to 1.1. As you recall, I said we don't want to block 1.1, and we also want this against 1.5. We don't really mind terribly about blocking 1.2, but I am showing you this. And you can see we're getting a remarkable degree of selectivity. They are 260-fold more selective compared to current phenytoin, which is a non-selective blocker. So we have much more potent drugs and much more selective in an in vitro cell culture system. So what happens in these animal models? And again, we are able to demonstrate very nice potency. And this is with this particular mutation in these mice. I believe we have got these mice from uh, Dr. Meisler. And you can see, as we give more of the drugs, so this is when we treat the animal, this is with a vehicle, this means just a control. This racing score is a score that gives you a degree of how much epilepsy, how many epileptic features we can score in these mice. So the higher that score, the, means, the more epilepsy they have, and we want to reduce that score. And you can see, as we give 10 milligrams per kilogram of our drug, and then we go to 30 milligrams, we get an even greater response. This is a dose response, which is exactly what you want to see when you're developing a drug. The more drug you give, the more efficacious, the more benefit is derived. And then this, this uh, over here, this graph shows you that we're developing a much more potent drug compared to phenytoin. So here's phenytoin, and here's the, this is a normalized racing score, which means we've corrected to one. So one means they're having a marked degree of epilepsy. Zero means there's no epilepsy whatsoever that we can detect in these animal models of SEN 8A gain of function. So this is um, a model where there's hyperactivity of SEN 8A, and we're actually inducing seizures by giving them electrical stimulation. And what we can show is that with enough drug, we can bring the seizures down to completely uh, zero amount of seizures. But you can see, whenever you shift this to the left, it's much more potent. So phenytoin works in this range, but our drugs are working much more to the left, where there's a much greater degree of potency. And this means that we have got selectivity not only in vitro, but as well in vitro, which is critical for advancing this program. So I just want to end on a couple of slides to tell you, so that's where we are today. And just to tell you what the challenges are as we move ahead, and my particular role at Xenon now is taking these compounds that uh, my non-clinical colleagues have developed and translating this into the clinic, into testing in, in patients with these conditions. So this is a cartoon showing you a traditional drug discovery paradigm. And what you can see is it's a long and winding road. It's a very challenging process. So we're here now, what we refer to as preclinical. And you can see um, that we've got a long road ahead in terms of time before you file what's called an NDA. That's a new drug application with the FDA, which then allows you to market the drug. 
Before that, we've got to file what's called an IND, an investigational new drug. And to do that, we would then have to, once we've done that, we would then have to test it starting in adults. The typical route for testing drugs is in adults. And of course, this is a big challenge for SCNA to gain a function because there aren't any adults or very few adults with this condition. But typically, what gets done is you'd have to do a phase one study, usually about 20 to 50 patients, to show that the drug is safe and doesn't cause any harm. And then you can migrate on to your phase two studies, which are larger studies, a couple of hundred patients. And what you do there is you want to show that the drug actually works. And you continue to monitor that the drug is safe. And you also want to find out what the best dose is for, taking, uh, for treating patients. And then you go on to phase three, which are typically much larger studies. And you can see the numbers there. We don't even have that number of patients with SE and HA gain of function to be looking at that. So that's the typical paradigm. And of course, we're going to have to work with the FDA to, to find ways around this. And this is what we refer to. It's a very rare condition, as you know, and we refer to it as an orphan condition. An orphan condition, the Orphan Drug Act came into to being in 1983, and it was devised, it's an FDA regulation that was devised specifically for rare disorders, rare being less than 200,000 patients across the whole of the United States. And one can get the status of orphan drug status awarded to you by the FDA if you have a drug that could specifically make a difference for an orphan condition for a rare disease, which of course SCNA to gain a function would qualify. The reason for, for mentioning this is because there's huge benefits and incentives for companies such as ourselves to develop these orphan drugs because there's tax incentives, there's incentives around market exclusivity exclusivity, which incentivizes companies to work on, on rare disease. But over and above that, what's really important is once it's been deemed an orphan drug, there is potential for an expedited path working with the FDA because they understand that these conditions are exceptionally rare and you can't go through that traditional path that I spoke to you about. So there's huge challenges in moving drugs forward through the clinical development path. And I just wanted to highlight some of those for you. So this is the second last slide. I'm drawing to a close here. We are in this era which I call precision medicine. And really it's where we understand the genetics and we're targeting the very primary root cause of disease. So we're really focusing on the cause of the underlying pathophysiology, the underlying cause for the particular condition. This, in this situation, as you understand, it's a hyperactivity of the NAV1.0 channel due to mutations in the SCNA gene itself. Um, so we're developing drugs that specifically target the, the appropriate mechanism. And of course what we need is better testing so we can identify these patients. We can't treat these patients specifically until we know who they are and where they are. And at this time I'm sure you all appreciate that it's somewhat limited in our ability to actually get the genetic testing done. But this needs to change over time. And in order to move forward, to develop these drugs, it really needs to be, and this is, we've worked in a number of orphan diseases, rare diseases, it really needs to be a collaboration amongst all the stakeholders in order to achieve success. And this means that it's the patient advocacy groups, you the parents, you need to work with us, it's the FDA, it's the, um, the key opinion leaders, um, and, all, and, and the drug development companies you need to work together to overcome these challenges in moving drugs through and doing clinical trials for these patients. So I'll just summarize in the last slide. We are in this era of precision medicine. New mutations, we understand, can lead to epilepsy. Specifically, mutations in the SE and ATA gene can lead to gain of function in that 1.6, lead to SE and ATA, what we refer to um, EIEE13, which is the gain of function in SE and ATA mutations. We understand that there are many different sodium channels with different functions throughout the body. And today, sodium channel blockers, they're non-selective, and they can cause side effects because of their non-selectivity. And we also appreciate that there's a very fine balance between NAV 1.6 and 1.1, and we don't want to disturb that balance. And so what Xenon is doing to achieve a, a treatment for this condition is developing highly selective NAV 1.6 blockers to only selectively block the, the, the channel that's defective, that's overactive. And I've shown you that the traditional clinical development path is rather onerous. It's a long and treacherous path. And using the orphan drug strategy, potentially, there could be an expedited and much easier route. 
to advancing therapeutics through the clinic, working with the FDA in this regard. And as I said in that last slide before this, we need a strong collaborative effort among researchers, amongst patient advocates, amongst uh, you, the, the parents, to work with us to advance these therapeutics uh, to enter the clinical trials to treat patients with this condition. Unfortunately, I forgot to put an a acknowledgement slide to all the colleagues of mine who are working on this at Xenon. I actually asked one of my colleagues how many people are working on this. There are 50 people at Xenon. The company is 100 people. Half the company is working on this condition, which really shows our immense dedication. We've got six people, most of them senior directors or VP level people who are at the meeting today. And I just want to thank all of them. I'm not going to mention their names. They know who they are for the incredible work they've done in what's actually a remarkable achievement to develop in these selective blockers. And hopefully in the not too long term, we can see the, the movement and translation into the clinic of these, of these compounds. Thank you for your time. I would like to invite up Dr. Mandy Harris. Thank you. Hello. So I'm not nearly as exciting. Um, I'm actually just a general child neurologist who happened to have a patient with um, SCN8A related epilepsy back when there was not a lot of uh, information about it, and um, I was just wanted to summarize kind of my experience and how I ended up, uh, I think I currently have uh, more patients than anyone else in the world uh, with this condition. So I'm just going through a timeline a little bit here. My first experience was um, the late summer of 2013. Um, this is when Adeline uh, was diagnosed, and um, at the time I had never had a patient with this. I did a lot of research, looked back. My boss is actually a geneticist, so I asked him about it. We found the one paper that um, was available at the time. Um, it was Dr. Hammer's uh, child uh, case report. And uh, Julianne contacted a bunch of people after we found out about that information. She brought a lot of people together, um, Dr.'s parent, Hammer, Heather Mefford. She got my email in on that. We had a lot of email conversations. Uh, we ended up uh, learning that Dr. Mefford and her group was working on uh, the phenotype paper. Um, and we kind of rapidly, she was on a deadline, we rapidly got all Adeline's information in there to get her in that paper, um, and that uh, very shortly after that, at AES in 2013, Dr. Mefford was presenting on uh, genetic epilepsy, and I kind of cornered her afterwards and said, all right, what's working? What works? What, what treats these patients? And she said, well, we're not really talking about that in our paper, um, but the, the children who are on sodium channel blockers seem to be doing the best. So I took that back in December uh, uh, to uh, Adeline's parents and said, hey, we should probably try a sodium channel blocker. That seems to make sense. You know, the paper talks about it being a gain of function mutation. Um, and I tease her about this all the time, but she said no. Um, and she went and got a second opinion <laughs> with somebody who actually was an expert um, in Dravet syndrome, and they said no, absolutely not, don't use that medicine. And so it was a few months later, um, five months later, I finally convinced her to try it. I said, hey, this makes sense please let me try it, um, and it worked. We actually subsequently got her the best seizure control um, that she'd had in her life, um, and she started uh, to have better development. I recently saw her back in clinic, well, it's actually been half a year ago now, but I saw her back in clinic age three. They moved out of state, they still come back and see me. Um, her three-year ASQ, which is the ages and stages questionnaire, it's a questionnaire that pediatricians, and I use it in my clinic in my research, um, to look at their development, and she was normal in all categories. Her development was normal, in communication, gross motor, fine motor, personal, social, and problem solving. And this is the paper that ended up coming out in 2015, which described the phenotype spectrum of SCNA day uh, related epilepsy. And then shortly after that, in September of 2015, I had my second patient that was actually referred through Julianne and through the Facebook page and through the parent organization. They said, hey, we're doing so well with this. Let's talk to Dr. Harris. Um, so they came to me, and we, um, I kind of did the same method that I did with her. Got him, got him on the trial at the cell. Um, it didn't work. Um, we're actually still working on his seizure control. It's doing a little better now on high-dose trileptal and high-dose dilantin. Um, but we've had to play with his a little bit 
um, but still following that same methodology that it seems like sodium channel blockers should be what works, um, and it, we're hoping it's working. Uh, the one thing that came out about this time was the survey that, was, that went through the registry and through the parents, um, where uh, I was just told, because of my connection with Julianne, about how all these patients seem to be doing worse on Keppra. And that was our experience, actually, with my second patient. He had been put on Keppra and did worse. And so we you know, weaned him off very quickly on the Keppra. It was also shortly after that, uh, in 2015, that there was an article published, and I didn't put it up here for sake of time, but that linked SCN 8A related epilepsy to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and so I contacted my arrhythmia specialist at Riley Hospital, and we had a bunch of meetings and talked about this and said, well, what do we do about this? And really not enough information. We should probably just do Holter monitors on these patients for now. So that's what we started doing. Every year we're doing 24-hour Holter monitors on these patients. Um, and then uh, my rhythm specialist is seeing them back. Um, and then my third patient happened um, in 2016. This was one actually was a, a colleague of mine who was a 12-year-old who has had um, static encephalopathy his entire life, had had seizures his entire life, and someone decided to go ahead and get the epilepsy panel, and they found an SCN8A uh, related uh, mutation. And this child had been on Keppra for probably eight years. Um, and so that was my first step was got him off that. Um, and he had never been on trileptol. So we put him on trileptol, very high dose. His seizures improved significantly. This was a child who came into the clinic when I saw him uh, wheelchair-bound, nonverbal, um, and he is now walking again. He's not very verbal, but he's having behavioral outbursts. He's kind of showing some autistic features, but he was nonverbal and wheelchair-bound. He's walking again. So we're getting there. He's not got 100% um, improvement in his seizures yet, but he's seeing my colleague, so it's kind of a little bit of me telling her what I think she should do and her maybe not necessarily doing at being as aggressive as I tend to be. Um, I push kids on very, very high levels, um, and I monitor levels, and I monitor um, sodium levels too, because I don't want their, to get hyponatremia from being on really high doses of sodium channel blockers, but it doesn't seem to be happening. And then um, the paper came out kind of early, or late 2015, early 2016, that actually supported what I've been doing. Um, the, the four patients that were on really high dose, phenytoin, they were requiring levels in the 30s, um, which most of us would say that's a toxic level as a child neurologist. You don't want somebody at a level of the 30s in, in phenytoin. Um, but that was the level these, these patients were requiring. So that was helpful to me that it was supporting kind of what I was doing clinically. And then uh, I saw my fourth patient face-to-face -face, um, just this year in 2016. This was a child who had seizures since two months of age. Um, this, was a, this started out as a phone consult. Um, as, Many in this room have talked to me by phone or email, or I've talked to your doctors by phone. Um, I have people call me and I suggest, here's what I've done. I'm not a researcher. I'm not doing this as a research basis. This is clinical. This is what it seemed to work. And so we actually met face-to-face -face at age two um, and uh, transitioned her over the phone to sodium channel blockers. She was already on some phenytoin, um, and we had been playing with her phenytoin and, and her um, trileptol, and she said improved seizure control and last I heard, she was having some improved development um, and doing a lot better, too. So my take-home point is I agree. The genetic epilepsies, I think, are just amazing in our opportunity to target treatments to the phenotype. Um, as a general child neurologist, we need to remember that we need to read up on recent literature and we get something that we've not seen before and not just lump it in to things that we think we know about. Um, I, and likely, these patients need very high doses of sodium channel blockers. I've um, used trileptol at sometimes twice what's considered the maximum upper limit to get a therapeutic level in a patient, and they've tolerated it. Um, and using dilantin at levels that we normally would consider toxic, but these children seem to tolerate it. Now, ultimately, I really hope that we get targeted treatment, because I think that's the future, um, and I think that would help a lot with all the side effects we're having um, from using such high dose um, sodium channel blockers. And then uh, recently, I sat down, or multiple emails back and forth uh, with Julianne and the group about publishing in that brochure what's been working um, and our recommendations. So the recommendations are early, high-dose sodium channel blockers um, and avoiding levetiracetam and um, monitoring levels to find that individual goal for the patient and not being afraid of published max doses. Um, monitoring the sodium levels, I haven't had any that have been abnormal, but um, in outside of this population I have. Um, and then because of the uh, risk for SUDEP, and also with my several of my patients, apnea seems to be a really big part of their seizures. And going apneic in another room when mom and dad aren't around is kind of scary. So 
we use some kind of apnea monitor or biox or something to alert parents that they're having a seizure or that they might have stopped breathing or had arrhythmia. And I just recommend that all parents are CPR trained so that they can do something about it if they do um, see their parent or see their child in distress. And then I also um, have started in the last year doing cardiology consults annually uh, for these patients with a rhythm specialist. And that's all in the brochures that are outside there if anyone wants to take those home. That's um, what I recommend to other physicians who get a patient with SCN8A related epilepsy. That's all I have. I would like to welcome up uh, Jennifer Stout. So this is Ryan. Um, he's five and a half now. So this is when um, a little bit before, before and a little bit after when all of this started. Um, it wasn't until November 2015 that we received Ryan's SCN8A diagnosis. But our journey with the disease began on December 24, 2011, one day shy of Ryan turning five months old. Over the course of one month, Ryan experienced three events, which consisted of body stiffening and turning blue due to a lack of oxygen. Events was how the doctors kept referring to them, because at the time I was the only one that was seeing him in these moments of distress. After the third trip to the hospital, I explained to the doctors that if they discharged Ryan, I was going to sit with him in the ER, because there was no doubt in my mind that this was going to happen again. Needless to say, Ryan was not discharged, and not only did the events occur again, they came on with a vengeance. Following an eight-day stay in the hospital, Ryan was diagnosed with a seizure disorder of unknown etiology. This was also the time when we first met Ryan's neurologist, Dr. Ethan Goldberg. Little did I know, that when, what an instrumental part he would play in Ryan's life and the life of my family. The first course of action for Ryan was phenobarbital, which worked very well at controlling his seizures. However, due to his typical functioning and cognitive development, the plan would be to eventually wean the phenobarbital and introduce a different medication. When that time came, Keppra was the drug of choice, and it came with many more seizures. After several weeks of seizures, 911 calls, ambulance rides, hospital stays, and increases in dosage, I pleaded with Dr. Goldberg to try something different. He agreed that it was time, and he prescribed Trileptol. This was our miracle drug. It worked almost instantaneously. For the next 21 months, not only did Ryan remain seizure-free, he continued to grow, develop, learn, and thrive. Although we were always ready to act if another seizure occurred, we were really starting to think that just maybe he had outgrown the seizures. But as the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. On July 27, 2015, just two days after turning four years old, Brian experienced a seizure, which resulted in a trip to the ER. Once there, the seizures kept coming. One, two, three, four, five. It was decided that the best course of care would be for Ryan to be admitted to the PICU. As soon as we arrived on the floor, we were surrounded by many doctors and nurses. It was very difficult to keep up with everything going on, but I did hear one of the doctors say that she thought Ryan was still seizing. All I could think was that if this was indeed, if he was still indeed in the middle of a seizure, this could have been happening for the past hour. And sure enough, that was the case. I learned several new vocabulary words that day. Status epilepticus, encephalopathy, intubation, tick line, lumbar puncture. When Ryan was finally extubated, it took longer than anticipated for him to regain consciousness. As a result, an MRI was conducted. We were told that Ryan had inflammation on the brain. When I asked what that meant for him going forward, the doctor's exact words to me were, some kids do not recover from this, but some kids do. They're just never the same. Then she just stood there staring at me. At that moment, I felt like Ryan's life was over, which in essence meant mine was as well. I spoke with Dr. Goldberg after the fact, and he assured me that although Ryan's condition was indeed acute, it was also not that black and white. When Ryan finally did wake up, he had to relearn how to do everything. Walk, talk, eat, drink, use the restroom, and even stay. As a result of the status, he experienced central vision loss. Thankfully, this was only temporary. 
As hard as all of this was to watch, the most difficult thing for me to witness as his mother was watching him have to relearn how to play. He had no idea what to do with his favorite toys, his cars, his trucks, blocks, musical instruments. In many ways, I had a four-year-old infant. I remember crying so hard that I couldn't breathe. I would just sit next to his bed, hold his hand, and take in his scent. Although this was an extremely dark time, the clouds did eventually begin to lift. After 68 days in the hospital and the rehab setting, we were finally able to take our baby home. By January, he was back in school, and by March, we really started to feel like we had gotten our little boy back. He truly did make a miraculous recovery. As I'm sure is the case for many of you, as the parents here, I have asked myself many times, why Ryan, why us? Although this is a devastating diagnosis and I would give my life to take it away from Ryan, I do believe that we were all chosen for a reason. It takes a strong person to endure what our children and all of us have been through. The strength, perseverance, and resiliency that emanates from each of these precious children is all inspiring. We as their parents are also pretty amazing. I think it's hard to remember that. It's hard to remember how strong we are when the weight that we carry is often so unbearable. But we were blessed with these children. They have no better advocate, no better teacher, and no better cheerleader. For the doctors and researchers here, I also believe that you were chosen to do what you do as well. If you ever question that, I want you to take a look at the magnets that are sitting in front of you. Those children staring back at you are the reason. And behind them are the parents, grandparents, and siblings who are so, so desperate for a cure. Before I end, I want to personally thank Dr. Goldberg for the dedicated professional and man that he is. There is no doubt in my mind that Ryan would not be where he is today without him. As if he doesn't have a big enough challenge fighting epilepsy, including SCNAA, he's been dealing with this mom for five years. And trust me, that's no easy task. I just wanted to take this time to publicly thank him for all his work. There truly are no words that can adequately express my gratitude. Thank you. Pardon if mascara is running down my face. Um, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Philip Pearl. Well, um, it goes without saying that this is a gripping meeting, and and you just did it brilliantly, Julianne and Hillary, having parents, and researchers, and clinicians sort of alternating and intercalating between each other. I, w I had the opportunity to speak here last year, and I was asked to give an update, so I'm I'm not promising a earth-shattering uh, research uh, sort of heavy scientific presentation as we heard from Xenon and, and UVA and Michigan is fantastic. Uh, I just thought I'd give um, an update from last year. So here goes, let's see, and I didn't turn it off, good. Um, this reminds me that in my 25 plus years now actually of practicing child neurology, one of the most palpable changes has been going to meetings like this of these specific genes, of the SCN1A meetings, there's an SCN2A meeting coming up in July. I recently came back from a KCNQ2 meeting in Silver Spring, Maryland. Last year in Boston, we held an SSADH meeting. This year we're hosting an AHC meeting, which is ATP1A2 and 1A3. It's like an alphabet soup, but it's pretty evident that we need to get these groups together and have a universal approach than having these smaller meetings that are splitting up the resources and efforts. I think that if there's anything that comes from this, I hope it's that. I just thought I'd sort of introduce the 8A concept to those who are less, you know, knowledgeable about this scientifically by pointing out that you've all heard, we've all heard so much about SCN1A. There was a time that people blamed the pertussis vaccine for causing severe epilepsy and the U.S. government paid, paid lots and lots of dollars to folks who had pertussis vaccine encephalopathy until we found out that most of those cases were actually SCN1A mutations. And there are many, many mutations of that gene. And then SCN2A became known, and that has um, I, I, several different phenotypes. So you know, you have one gene, and you can have these different sorts of clinical presentations, a benign familial neonatal infantile seizure 
syndrome versus the generalized or genetic epilepsies with febrile seizures versus Dravet-like disorders, Otahara, et cetera, et cetera. 9A is emerging as an important sodium channel uh, as a sort of a susceptibility gene. And of course, our focus is 8A. So last year I had presented this one infant. Is this family here? Uh, not this family. So I wanted to, pre I presented this case because it was so interesting that this little child presented at five months of age with spells that were misdiagnosed as Sandifer syndrome, reflux related symptoms. And it, it really wasn't recognized until 11 months of age that these were infantile spasms. And it's just something to look out for. And the child went on Levetiracetam, Keppra, right? Because they would seem focal in some ways and did not do well at all. Went on Clobazam, Phenobar, vitamin B6, folinic acid. And I thought I'd show some video EEG of our patients because we've had great talks. We haven't actually seen some of the seizures. So here, is the episode, see the stiffening episode, associated with rhythmic slowing in sort of a lot of the channels of the page. And then the arms relax, and it, this was the spasm. And it clustered, it happened again and again. Yes, let me see what happens in the next, can you turn on that video as well? Oops, this one. So the, the, the video was dark, but it's the same stiffening of the arms, and the EEG is showing that same rhythmic slow wave pattern during the spasm. But the EEG between the spasms did not show this high voltage chaotic pattern we call hypsarrhythmia, so this was missed. These infantile spasms, most clinicians associate spasms with an EEG that shows hypsarrhythmia, but the EEG background was actually pretty unremarkable, and that's why this was missed for months and months. So SCN8A is a very tricky diagnosis uh, for, for a clinician. So what I thought I'd do this year is show you the series we have at Boston Children's of our SCN8A. Uh, I think we have eight. Um, and there's a lot of, too much detail for an after-dinner talk, but I do have a summary at the end. But I organized our patients based on their age of onset. So you see on the left we have the newborn, who actually wasn't diagnosed until nine years of age. It's currently 11 years of age. But I wanted to point out that seizures were initially neonatal seizures, just undiagnosed for years. And the child had a lot of status epilepticus. And notice I wrote CPR times three, so the child coded three different times. Oh, clearly a risk factor for SUDEP. Um, the treatment included a pacemaker. But Dr. Harris gave this wonderful talk just a few minutes ago, and I think she's right. We have to think about cardiac arrhythmia, consultations and pacemakers in these patients. The child's been treated with phenobarb, lamotrigine, valpre, levetiracetam, clovazam, topiramate, but currently is nonverbal and nonambulatory. And I, I went through all of our patients, and I just wanted to point out that one. Lots of things on all these. Uh, a couple presented at three weeks of age. Those were, those were twins. Then a seven week of age. The current ages, though, are interesting. The three-year-olds, a 13-year-old, 13-year-old has a moderate intellectual disability, not too bad. And here's the, here's the other four presenting at anywhere from 2 to 14 months of age, currently between 22 months and 15 years of age. That last one, these mutations are different from each other. It's been seizure-free for a couple of years, has a normal IQ, so clearly there's a wide spectrum. And like with any other disease, we always start with the most severe and then we learn there are more and more out there with different variants that are not as severe. We also have several patients who have SCN 8A variants of unknown significance that might be causing the epilepsy, but we're not sure yet. I did not include them. I just included the ones where we really think uh, it's very clear that these are SCN 8A epileptic encephalopathies or related epilepsy. So here's a summary. The onset was anywhere from newborn to 14 months of age, but median at two months. They were diagnosed anywhere from one to 14 years, but the median was two and a half. The current ages are 22 months to 15 years. Seizure types have been neonatal, infantile spasms, tonic-clonic, myoclonic, focal, and status. Lots of medications, ketogenic diet, endotracheal tube intubation, pacemaker have all been used. And the outcomes of our eight patients, five are nonverbal, two have intellectual disability, 
and one just learning disabilities with a normal IQ. So that's our series. And I wanted to finish because one of our patients, and her mom is back there waving her hand, she made the press. This is a Boston Children's Hospital newsletter this month, and she's just become a favorite. Is there a pointer on this? Huh? Oh. Anyway, there she is in the middle with all the nurses and the nursing staff, so that's our series. We've got eight patients, and maybe we can get a clinical trial going with some of these promising therapies. So thank you very much. I would like to welcome up Dr. Elizabeth Doner. Okay. Here. That's the pointer. Yeah. And then forward. That way. Okay. Great. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Donner. I am a child neurologist in Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children, and I also study SUDEP, or Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, and I study that specifically in children. Um, they tend to put SUDEP at the end of the program, um, so, and I, so I hope we have some other topics to talk about um, after, because it's not always the happiest topic to end on. And it's hard to be here today and talk to you all about that because I hear from just being here and hearing your very uh, important stories that this is a topic of great interest to the SCNA families and I know it's also a topic of great interest to the neurologists and the doctors that treat you. So um, I'm going to talk, not, I'm not presenting research today, I was asked to give a little bit of an update talk on SUDEP and just to share information with you. Um, I know we haven't been having questions, but if people have questions afterwards, they can find me and I'd be happy to answer them because I'm afraid I can't get to every single thing that might be running through people's head. Um, so, there we go. So, um, you know, when you look at uh, mortality and epilepsy in general, we know that people with epilepsy are an increased risk of early death compared to the general population, and that's all people with epilepsy. Okay, so, um, People with epilepsy are about two to three times more likely to die earlier than people without epilepsy. Um, that's even higher for children, okay? And I'm going to get to the reasons for that. And the reasons for that are not SUDEP, they're um, other. So let's talk about that. So here's a, a, a very important study that was done, um, very powerful study. So actually, Matty Salampa, what he did is he identified 245 children who were diagnosed with epilepsy back in 1964, and he followed them for 40 years. So we can see what happens to those people, um, and he's actually done a lot of work looking at all sorts of things about what happened to their epilepsy, but in this one paper, he, pres um, he explained what happened with regards to um, whether they died or not. And at 40, by the time 40 years had passed, 24% had died, and that was three times what you would expect from the general population. So that's about what I said, right? People with epilepsy are at about a three times increased risk of death in general. Um, now, the majority of those deaths occurred in adulthood. So this is mortality in childhood onset epilepsy, meaning epilepsy that starts during childhood, but the deaths actually occurred um, for the most part while they're, they were adults. And I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But in general, the risk factors um, so what puts a person with epilepsy more at risk to die early are um, having active epilepsy, which means not obtaining five years seizure-free, so continuing to have seizure, um, and having what we call symptomatic epilepsy, which is sometimes defined as epilepsy related to um, an underlying brain malformation or sometimes an underlying genetic malformation so that we know the cause of your epilepsy. And another important one is this uh, medical intractability, um, which is this idea that the seizures don't respond to medication, haven't stopped with medication. And finally, drug adherence, so people who don't always take the drugs as they're prescribed. So those are the things that, in general, if you take a person with epilepsy, you follow them for a long time, childhood onset epilepsy, these are the things that put you at risk for having premature death. 
So why would a person with epilepsy die? Well, of course, it's going to have nothing to do with the epilepsy at all, just like all the reasons why we all will die. Um, sometimes it can be related to the underlying cause of the epilepsy. Some people have seizures associated with a neurodegenerative disease or some other disorder that in and of itself is associated with premature death. And then we talk about deaths that are due to epilepsy. And among those, we talk about deaths that can be a direct consequence of a seizure. And in that, you could consider things like you have a seizure and then a drowning is associated with a seizure or another trauma associated with a seizure. You can consider that rarely um, people die in status epilepticus. In fact, that's very rare in children. It's less rare in adults to die of status epilepticus, more rare in children to die of status epilepticus. And then finally, the thing I'm going to talk to you about today, which is sudden unexplained or unexpected death in epilepsy. Now, we call it sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, but I put the unexplained there because people used to call it that, and it's the same thing, so I don't want people to think it's two different conditions. So it's just basically the same thing. In general, sudden death is about 24 times more likely in people with epilepsy than people without epilepsy. So even if the numbers are small, it's still much more common in people with epilepsy. And I, I said I was going to talk a little bit in general around um, when children with epilepsy die, what are the causes of their death? And that's really important um, for us to understand so that we can kind of adjust our thinking and think realistically about who's at risk and, and why they're at risk. So um, this paper, uh, what they did was uh, Dr. Berg and her colleagues um, they combined four other papers that just looked at mortality in a series of kids who had epilepsy and looked very carefully at why it was that they died and, and reviewed all the cases. And so when they combined them, they actually get, um, they, they were able to report on not the death of, but the lives of over 2,000 um, children with new onset epilepsy, followed for a total of 30,000 person years. A person year, actually, it's worth saying, is a person with epilepsy living for a year. So if I had 10 person years, I could have 10 people for one year, or I could have one person for 10 years. And that's kind of like a denominator for us to try and describe these, these things to people. So the, the take home messages from that paper, which I think are very important, is first off, most deaths in children with epilepsy are not actually epilepsy related. So if you look at, I'm just going to pull out this, and I just want you to not, you know, I've drawn a line through it essentially because this is that 40-year paper, and I told you most of those deaths happen in adults, right? So this isn't the one to look at when we want to know about deaths in children. So most of the deaths in children with epilepsy are not epilepsy related. Here in these three studies, the yellow bars were the non-epilepsy related deaths. So if they're not epilepsy related, what do they die of? Well, for the most part, they die of pneumonia. And we actually heard a very moving story right towards the end of dinner, that woman talking about her son who lived three and a half or so years. And she did describe a boy who had developed chronic lung disease in association with multiple hospitalizations and, and probably loss of lots of chest infections. And in children who have uh, chronic neurological disorders, um, and here we're not talking about children who are otherwise well with seizures, but more talking about children who get recurrent infections. They, they, a way that those children some, most often die is from pneumonia. So pneumonia is the most common cause of non-epilepsy-related death in children with epilepsy. And when we look at epilepsy-related deaths, in fact, SUDEP, or sudden death in epilepsy, is the most common cause. The other ones which um, are less common are status epilepticus, that's in blue. And then um, aspiration, which is choking, right? So you don't actually necessarily get a pneumonia, but sometimes when kids are having a seizure, they can choke. And some of you are probably very familiar with that. And so rarely that's a cause of death. So just to summarize, we know that kids are at increased risk of dying if they have epilepsy. And we know that the most common non-epilepsy related reason for that is um, pneumonia. And the most common epilepsy related reason is SUDEP. 
So I just want to go back a moment and just point something out because I realize in an effort to make this talk, which is usually an hour talk, into more of a 20-minute talk, I've left out a slide that addresses an important point. The majority of um, deaths in children with epilepsy are in children who have complex neurological conditions with multiple, as doctors we use the word comorbidities, right? So a bunch of other things wrong with them, okay? So the, that and when you think about the children who develop the, the frequent chest infections and free, frequent pneumonias, those are in fact um, those kids who have these very complicated uh, conditions with lots of other problems to go with their epilepsy. And so when we see um, higher death rates in children with epilepsy compared to like let's say adults with epilepsy, all of that increased risk, all of that increased rate of death is related to children with very complex neurological conditions. And I know that does relate to some children with SCN8A, we know that. Um, but at the same time, um, we have to understand the spectrum of SCN8A likely influences the mortality risk in those, in those children. Okay, so I'm supposed to talk about SUDEP, so here we are. So what is SUDEP? Well, this is a table, there's a, a lovely paper um, that goes through all the definitions and how to understand and everything. The reference is there at the bottom, um, first authored by Lena Nash, our colleague. But really what SUDEP is, is when a person with epilepsy has an unexpected death and we cannot find an obvious cause. So to meet full criteria for SUDEP, we need an autopsy to be performed, and we need the autopsy not to show the cause of death, okay? We exclude cases of um, status epilepticus, although that can be hard to do, because when we start thinking about SUDEP deaths, often they happen when people are, um, un often the deaths are unwitnessed, so you don't really know what was happening before they died. So in fact, SUDEP, it's possible that they had a prolonged seizure, so for that reason we put in the word um, exclude somewhere documented status epilepticus so that there was proof that there was status epilepticus, we exclude those cases. But basically it's an, a sudden unexpected death in a person with epilepsy. And how common is this? Well, if you look at all people with epilepsy, adults, children, kind of severe epilepsy, more mild epilepsy, you just take every, every epilepsy, it's about one in a thousand people per year. So 1,000 people living with epilepsy and for over a year, one will die. Now, I, I mentioned that the severity of a child's neurological condition and the severity of their health condition influences their risk of death. That's true for SUDEP as well. So um, rates of SUDEP are much higher in people with drug-resistant epilepsy. So if seizures are not controlled by medication, and this is mainly adult data, but in adults with drug-resistant epilepsy, it's almost 10 times higher. So the number is more like nine per 1,000 people per year, okay? Um, and I realize that I've left off a decimal point here, which is kind of a bad thing to do. Um, but the rates are 10 times lower in children than they are um, in the general uh, population of people with epilepsy, so about 0.2 per thousand, or you can think of two per 10,000 per year in children with epilepsy, and that's all people, all children with epilepsy, not specific to a genetic condition. Most of the time, uh, people who die of SUDEP are found dead in bed, most often in the face down position, or what we call the prone position, and um, uh, most deaths are unwitnessed. So um, it depends on the series you look at. I actually reported 27 cases of CDEP in children um, in the province of Ontario where I live, and um, we actually had a pretty high witnessed rate because um, I think when you look at cases in children, I think, well, I don't have to tell you that children with significant epilepsy aren't alone very often. I think their parents or other caregivers keep such a close eye on them. So um, for that reason, witnessed SUDEP is a little bit more common in children. But I have to say, I think that's one of the really important reasons why SUDEP is so much more rare in children, because of all the care and attention that their, their parents and grandparents and siblings are, are giving them. So there, and that, that actually gets me to this statement, which is not Nocturnal supervision may be protective for SUDEP. So there's a little bit of data in the literature that suggests 
that if somebody, if there's somebody who is watching you overnight, they don't have to be watching you, that that may reduce risk, okay? And that data comes from, for example, um, a case series, so a series of patients that were reported, and this was reported some time ago, where um, all the young, they was kind of like teens and young adults, and they all lived in a care facility, like in a group home type setting, in an institution, and um, all the suit of deaths that happened within that series actually happened um, when those individuals were outside of those super, that supervised environment, okay, so not sleeping, sleeping elsewhere, not sleeping within this place where there's kind of, a, they're in a group setting and there's someone checking on them through the night. Um, there was also um, information from another series that suggested that if people either shared a room or had um, frequent nocturnal checks, so someone popping in on them, that that also reduced risk. So people in that situation were less likely to die of SUDEP. In general, when we look at SUDEP, you know, one of the big mysteries and massive frustrations is that uh, we all know people who have had hundreds of seizures in their lifetime and lived and not died of SUDEP. And then we know people who had hundreds and then what happened on that one day that, that precipitated SUDEP. So SUDEP is not always preceded by a seizure, I should add. Um, the, the definition actually makes a point of saying that you don't have to see a seizure happen before, before SUDEP. And that's important because um, it's a challenge sometimes for us to find SUDEP cases to study. And one of the misconceptions is that if they didn't have a seizure, that it was like at the time when they died, that it wasn't SUDEP. And then we don't get to kind of collect that case for study. People call it something else. So I'll, I'll point that out for you as well. So um, what are, how do we identify people who are most at risk of SUDEP? So the most, most, most important risk factor is frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures, okay? Frequent full body shaking convulsive seizures. That is the strongest risk factor. It comes out in every study. I think we can very confidently say that's the most important risk factor. Um, and I, I've written here polytherapy and put a line through it because you know polytherapy means taking multiple drugs for your epilepsy, right? And there was an early study that actually found that being on more than one drug was a risk factor for SUDEP. Now, what they didn't do was they forgot, or I don't know if forgot, but they, they failed to control for or take into account how many seizures the person were having. So once you, t so of course people who take more meds probably have more seizures, that's why they need to take more meds. So once you take, once you account for um, how many seizures people are having, it's the number of seizures that predict the SUDEP risk. Not the, um, not the number of drugs they're on. And there was some nice follow-up work done with that, looking very carefully at whether there's any, whether the number of drugs or any specific drug increases SUDEP risk, and, it, and they don't, okay? So SUDEP risk, in fact, um, being on drugs for your epilepsy might actually reduce SUDEP risk. When they did a study looking at all the trials, all the drug trials for epilepsy, not all, but many, um, they looked at all the randomized control trials, and you know these are the studies where they take a group of patients and let, like let's say half get the medicine, a new medicine, and half stay on their regular medicines. The ones who got the new medicine at a dose that was later shown to be effective for epilepsy had a lower SUDEP rate than the people who just stayed on their previous medicines. So in fact, for a very short while in our SUDEP community, people were thinking too many drugs might increase risk. But now it, I think it's become quite clear that too many drugs does not increase risk, and maybe even being on good drugs reduces risk, okay? So we really have to treat people with epilepsy. I know it's hard to put kids on drugs, but I'm passionate about it. Another um, important risk factor is nocturnal seizures. That's not really surprising when you think about the so seizures that happen at night. Um, somebody thought when I said that 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 meant just see, like people who just had seizures at night. No, it's not that. It's people who have epilepsy and some of their seizures happen at night. And that kind of makes sense when you think about the circumstances in which these deaths often happen, which is from sleep in bed. So another risk factor that I want to talk to you about is um, this idea of duration of epilepsy. 
Okay, so the longer that a person has had epilepsy, the higher their rate, their risk of CDEP. And I guess that kind of makes sense, um, but there's something to understand there that we, we don't understand yet, but something to understand about the cumulative burden of, of epilepsy on something that we don't understand that, that makes CDEP more likely to occur. So can we prevent CDEP? You know, I told you, this is, this is very generic advice. I told you the most important risk factor is frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures. The thing that I think um, people fail to understand is that risk, when we talk about frequent generalized tonic-clonic seizures, there are people living with epilepsy, um, well adults living with epilepsy, going to work every day, living their lives, and maybe eight or ten times a year, maybe once a month, they have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. That is considered frequent. So the risk of SUDEP is exponentially increasing with each extra generalized tonic-clonic seizure, such that even having three or more generalized tonic-clonic seizures a year significantly increases risk of SUDEP. So when we think about reducing seizure frequency, we really need to focus on, if you're thinking about SUDEP risk, you really need to focus on the generalized tonic-clonic seizures, so the big shaking ones, and really trying to get them right down as close to zero as we can, okay? Um, so that means that in general, when I as a doctor and my colleagues, when we talk to people about SUDEP risk, that the best way to prevent SUDEP is to reduce the number of seizures people are having. And the best ways to do that are to take the drugs that you're prescribed or whatever treatment, be it the ketogenic diet, which I have great success with as well in my center. So whether it, you know, um, whether it means identifying seizure triggers and avoiding those, um, and this is kind of generic information that we give to, you know, everybody. Go to your appointments with your doctor, tell them if you're having more seizures, when um, the story someone talked about where the drugs weren't working and then they went on the diet, it was very frustrating to wait five or six months to be put on the ketogenic diet. That idea that when drugs aren't working, we need to look for other therapies. All these things are things that we think of them as just treating epilepsy, but actually at the same time, they're reducing state up risk. And, and so we really need to feel very, I feel very strongly about that. Finally, um, you know, uh, I have like a whole, Dr. Buckhalter at the back has heard me give it. I have like a whole one hour talk about why we need doctors and families to talk about SUDEP together and how important that is. Because if you don't know any of this, then the, your, the motivation to, to keep seizures under control and all that, we're not being honest about what, what's, what's at stake, right? So I actually think that um, education of people with epilepsy caregivers and providers, because I still go to plenty of meetings um, as a neurologist where the doctors that I talk to are not fully informed about um, SUDEP. So, um, I think education is a very strong uh, prevention tool. She wants to talk too. That's okay. That's okay. It's great. Um, so uh, I think education is really a very um, important tool in our armamentarium against CDEP. As far as things that don't have as much evidence behind them, but I know people think a lot about, one is the use of seizure, seizure detection devices. Actually, just for fun of the families, who is using some kind of device? Does that include baby monitors? What, what if, what if, what, oh, in addition, how many are you using? For, for like every night, like all the time? Okay, that's a lot of monitors. So um, the only monitor that I really endorse to families um, right now is a baby monitor because it's the only one that I think is the least intrusive. I absolutely understand that families use other devices. I, I completely do. I'm not saying they don't work. I'm just saying I feel like the most, the best thing to just recommend to most patients is to use a baby monitor so that they can hear their child if they have a seizure. But um, the thing about the seizure detection devices is um, despite sometimes how 
um, they're portrayed maybe in advertisements and stuff, we're, we're not going to have data to show that seizure detection devices reduce the risk of SUDEP. Um, some very good scientists have done the math. You know, you'd have to give out a lot of those devices, un thankfully, until you actually, you know, you'd have to give them out to a lot of people and then wait to see if people died or not. And, and it's just those are not feasible trials. So I do think that seizure detection devices, though, are going to have a place in helping people to determine to, to be alerted when their, their loved one has a seizure. Um, but I don't think we're going to get the data to prove that they can reduce SUDEP. I think we're going to get data that shows that they can alert us to seizures. And then I'm talking here to a group of people who have children, maybe adult children, I don't know, but who are caring for someone with SCN8A. Um, but there's a lot of people living with epilepsy who live by themselves. And so having a seizure detection device, if you don't have anybody to answer the beep, is not is not helpful, um, but they are they're definitely getting, having an increased role in how people families take care of and care for uh, their people their loved ones with seizures. Um, nighttime supervision we talked a little bit about that. I know people ask me about the anti suffocation pillows. I can't find any data about anti suffocation pillows, but I know that people use them. But there's no literature to support it. I'm sure. Well. Depends, but if you go and talk to your doctors about all the different things that we read about online and, you know, hear about, um, we often hear about things and we don't have evidence they work. It doesn't mean that they don't work, but we just don't have any way of knowing. Um, and family of education, I'd still like to find a way to prove that that works, but um, I think it's important even if we can't prove it. So what is being done to try and get to the bottom of this? You know. Um, I don't know if people were, were you all here all day today? Yeah, because um, Elson So, who's a former uh, president of AES, gave a lecture earlier today and he talked about, um, actually he talked about SUDEP and he talked about, you know, the evolution of SUDEP research and where it's going and where it was and everything. And there's been an explosion in SUDEP research, honestly, thanks in part to groups like CURE, Tracy's here today from CURE, um, that we're making like amazing, incredible strides. So actually, I feel like at this point, a lot is being done. And when I started studying this, um, my first paper in this field was uh, 15 years ago, um, there was barely anything being done. So it's really a tremendous improvement in the real, the real scientists trying to understand. You've heard some great examples today of people trying to understand what's happening with channelopathies. And that same type of work is trying to understand what's happening with SUDEP and it makes me very excited. So um, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I think that uh, there's been an increasing focus on identifying who's most at risk and not just I told you about the clinical risk factors, but trying to actually look at some biological factors about what make people with epilepsy more or less at risk of SUDEP. And one of them, of course, has focused on the genetics. And that's one reason that people who have SCNA in their family are worried about SUDEP because you've heard about this channelopathy stuff, right? So, um, you know, Alicia Goldman and Jeff Nobles identified um, a mouse that had potassium muta mutations in a potassium channel that were present in both the heart and the brain. So, the one, you know, to simplify it, the brain ones kind of give the seizures and the heart ones increased the risk of death. And those animals did have sudden death. And now we've seen in, you know, we've seen nice work presented um, and, and further more presented at this meeting um, around cardiac arrhythmias in mice with SCNNA. We've seen um, uh, also um, Dr. Meisler's work, which was referred to here today, um, about um, the mouse model of SCN1A in epileptic encephalopathy having seizures and suit up. So this work is slowly getting to the bottom of it, and I feel very hopeful about it. And while we're talking about SCN8A and SUDEP, you know, in preparation to come here and talk to you today, I did make an effort to look and try and learn more specifically. I understand that people, um, I can understand why there's a feeling that um, people with SCN8A are more at risk for SUDEP. I can understand how we would presume that, but there's actually, no, and I can see why based on the mouse models, I can see why based on the fact that it's a sodium channel mutation, I can see why based on the fact that it is often associated with a quite a significant or severe epilepsy, but actually when you go digging in the literature, there's not a lot 
of case reporting of series um, of children or adults with SCNA day who um, have had SUDEPs. And so I think the story's not, not told yet. I still think we don't know that much about it. I wish I had more to tell you. And I'd actually love the opportunity to talk to the families um, who have lost um, an SCN 8A person um, and uh, so that we can start trying to tease it out and figure out what it is about those people that they passed um, and what is it about the people who we still have with us and how we can figure that out. So I think that would be a great opportunity, hopefully a collaboration going forward. Um, there's also a lot of work looking at EEG markers um, and what EEG abnormalities may predispose people to suit up. And I'll just summarize that very quickly to say that there's something called postictal generalized EEG suppression or PGES. And in, a, in studies where they've actually had people um, on EEG at the time that they died, which is obviously not common, but um, if you, uh, Dr. Philippe Rivlin kind of looked at cases from across the world like that, they did find an EEG pattern in the seizures of people who ended up dying of SUDAP. So there's also work to try and identify just things that might help us, we call them biomarkers, something about the person that might in, in, um, reflect increased risk. And of course, the most, the strongest advantage to identifying who's most at risk would be that if we can come up with more targeted prevention strategies like um, which monitors or which meds or whatever, that you could target those specifically to people who are most at risk. So um, this is just a summary slide to say who's the most, um, at, who's, who's most at risk of SUDA based on what we know now. And that really is uh, adults with early onset epilepsy and refractory generalized tonic lung seizures. Okay, um, and we do need to consider the specific epilepsy syndromes. Okay, there's more and more coming out about uh, SCN1A mutations and where the risk might be of SUDEP in that. And now we're seeing the, the different mouse and rodent models of the different channelopathies. And I think that's evolving very quickly and we're going to learn a lot more in the next few years. And just before, I want to go back to this because I want to tell you that um, one of the challenges in learning about SUDEP is collecting information about cases. And one of our approaches to this has been to have registries. I actually maintain a, a pediatric registry in Canada of all SUDEP cases in Canada. Well, I try to get as many SUDEP cases in Canada as I can identify in children. And then I also collaborate with the North American SUDEP registry, which takes adult and pediatric cases of any kind, and it's family referral. So if you know a family that lost someone to SUDEP, they can contact this. Uh, they can contact this North American SUDEP registry, and we can get data from the family and that's how we learn about these cases. And the last thing is that we, uh, you know, it's a hard thing to talk about. I appreciate that you were brave enough to sit here and let me talk to you about it for 20 minutes or so, but there are um, lots of resources online um, and there's just two places to suggest that I know have repl reputable resources, one of which is Suit Up Aware, which is an organization um, out of Canada that I helped co-found, where we have um, a fair bit of information online, and then epilepsy.com through the Suit Up Institute has information online as well. That's it. Um, so we're going to um, just want to let everyone know, I know it's starting to get late. We have two more speakers. Um, we're going to end with Michael Hammer talking about the registry. So it's especially important for uh, the families to stay to learn more about that. Um, but we want to just um, interrupt the talks for a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, and clinicians. I'm sorry. Yeah, and clinicians. Um, so we want to interrupt the talks for a little minute uh, to do something kind of fun. Um, there are a bunch of members of our community that go above and beyond in their support of our SCNA Day family. Um, and there are individuals who we feel should really be recognized for that contribution. Um, Julianne kind of was toying around with a, a way to recognize folks, and she envisioned an idea of 
um, awards um, called the Cuties, um, <laughs> Champions for Understanding, Treating, Investigating, and Empowering Those with SCNA Day. Um, and in the spirit of this being a clinician, researcher, and family event, we uh, decided to give one award um, tonight in each of those categories. So do you want to come up and do the first? Okay. And I'll stay here with us. <laughs> the first category is for an outstanding researcher, for a champion in investigating SCN8A. We have had the opportunity to interact with a number of amazing researchers over the years, and we've also had the opportunity to offer grants for research. The individual receiving this award has not yet had his work funded by the Cute Syndrome Foundation, but has collaborated on many SCN8A projects, including Dr. Miriam Meisler's on her vital SCN8A research, which the Cute Syndrome Foundation helps to fund. He has also been present and active at every SCN8A event, so for his engaged and collaborative efforts for SCNAA research, we would like to offer this Cuties Award <laughs> to Dr. Minaj Patel. Our second category is for an outstanding clinician, a champion in treating SCN8A. The individual receiving this award has helped set the standard of care for patients of SCN with SCN8A, going above and beyond by exploring out-of-the-box treatments to directly and indirectly improve the quality of life for many SCN8A patients. She personally treats four SCN8A patients and is consulted on a dozen more cases. She is, the con she is one contributor to the Cute Syndrome Foundation's Clinician Reference Guide, which Hillary mentioned we made this past summer, as well as an asset to assist other physicians and families. For being a true role model for clinicians and an advocate for individuals with SCNA Day and their families, we offer this Cuties Award to Dr. Mandy Harris. This one's going to be a little long, and you guys just bear with me here. Our third category is for an outstanding family member, <clears throat> a champion in empowering those with SCNA Day. I met this young mom last year in Philadelphia, where she attended the gathering with her son, Dustin, and all four of his grandparents. I was struck by her tremendous poise by the love that was so evident between all of them, and by the sweet joy that I saw in her son's eyes. She was in school for graphic design, and is just about to graduate, actually, um, and she offered to volunteer for us as a graphic designer, um, and we gratefully accepted. Uh, she redes redesigned our logo and helped with a number of graphics projects over the last year, including this Faces of SCNA Day banner, um, which she put together as a striking visual for this event, and which has been uh, an image around which our community has rallied. <clears throat> when Dustin entered the hospital in September and it became clear that he might not recover, uh, Jessica and I were in touch quite a bit, and I saw in her uh, the kind of strength that <clears throat> was earned caring for Dustin as he fought through m so many impossible moments in his short life moments that no child and no mother should ever have to experience. Dustin passed away on September 18th, not long after celebrating his second birthday. As Jessica has dealt with the pain of this unbearable loss, she has done so with tremendous grace, asking how she could continue to help our foundation, and she has continued to help us in so many ways. <clears throat> She's here with us today. And, uh, and she's here despite the fact that it's, it's difficult for her to be here. 
Um, and she's here because she feels like she can continue to fight for her son as she helps us all fight for all of our children with SCNA Day. So for being a champion and empowering those with SCNA Day, and we offer this Cuties Award to Jessica Jenkins and her son, Dustin Jenkins Hyde. Need better mascara. Uh, I'd like to invite Tracy Dixon. <laughs> hey, well, it's a, an honor to be here. Um, haven't had a good cry in a while, so thank you, everyone. I, I don't know how long I've known Dr. Donner, but I, I've heard that talk, I think, for about 10 years now. I just can't forget that he's here. I don't know how you do it. Um, my hat's off to you. I couldn't do it. So, and. Um, what an inspiring night. I'm, thank you for having me here. So I'm um, taking a little liberty with my, my talk here. Um, I wear many hats. Um, I'm Associate Research Director at Citizens United for Research and Epilepsy Cure. Um, but I am also a scientist, um, a cellular and molecular neurophysiologist by training, um, who did a neurogenetics clinical research uh, postdoc. And so I have a research hat, a clinical hat, and most importantly, I'm a mother of a child who has Lennox Gastaut syndrome who's 23 years old. And so um, you'll probably get a little bit of several of those hats tonight in my talk. And I hope that after you hear what I have to say, and I will go fast because I know it's getting late, is that you'll feel inspired about what you're doing and the change that you're going to make. Because mothers and fathers and expanding that, loved ones um, of all types are changing the world. And it's, and it's in partnerships like this with doctors and clinicians and researchers who are changing the world every day, but you never think about moms and dads and loved ones you know, changing the world, and they are. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, somebody that I respect deeply um, who founded Citizens United for Research and Epilepsy. Um, she founded it with a, a number of other mothers who um, don't want to take any credit for um, founding the organization. And it was founded in 1998 um, because back in 1998, um, if you had epilepsy, you uh, couldn't die from it. And 70% um, of people don't know the cause of epilepsy, but thank goodness we don't need to know the cause in order to treat it. And um, generally, all of the drugs have been developed in adults with partial epilepsy as an add-on therapy and were extrapolated to children without actual data that had been had created in children. And the major messaging at that time was that um, epilepsy is a condition you can live with and you don't, don't discriminate against us. We, we're strong, we can go out in the world, we can conquer and we can, we can achieve. And so don't take away our jobs, don't take away our licenses. And that was the main messaging, and yet there was this whole group of mostly children, like yours, like mine, that were not getting the attention that they deserve. And that is why CARE was founded. It was founded by mothers of kids with catastrophic epilepsy that wanted dollars to go into research because no support groups and no empowerment messaging about jobs and things along those lines uh, were going to help their kids who were in diapers, who couldn't get out of bed, who spent all their time in the hospital, and who were dying. So. I, um, uh, I have a lot of respect for Susan. Her daughter is 10 years older than my daughter, and her journey is very similar to the journey that we have been on. And she founded an organization completely dedicated to funding research. So if you were in Elson So's talk today in the Hoyer lecture, you learned about how Cure and a couple of other mothers, mothers of these two boys who died from SUDEP, really um, built and founded the basic mechanistic research into SUDEP in the space. SUDEP had been defined and it was, it was um, known about, but we were still telling patients you can't die from epilepsy until these, these moms came on the scene. And I can remember going to meetings, AES meetings like this, and clinicians would see them coming and they're like, oh my gosh, our moms are coming. They're gonna come wanna talk about death and SUDEP and, and we're gonna go the other way because they would literally you know, turn the other way and go the other way. And now, I mean, SUDEP is being he's posted at the lawyer lecture. And so 
this organization and the moms, um, Susan Axelrod here on the left with her daughter Lauren, Christopher Donaldty and his mother Jean Donaldty, and then Gardner Lapham who lost her four-year-old son Henry after only two seizures. Um, we're all pioneering in, in being in the place that we are today in founding Cure. And so today, CARE has raised over $40 million for research, and 92% of everything that they raise goes directly into their mission of research and some awareness, because we knew that we couldn't raise money for research without first telling people that epilepsy is not okay. There are a whole group of people that are not living life well, and we need research to find the answers for kids like ours. And so I think, you know, I, I hope that some of you are surprised by this because um, I, I hope that the generation has changed enough that we now talk about epilepsy as a spectrum that it is in ways that we didn't 20 years ago. Um, so we fund mostly uh, research grants. We focus on basic and translational research and we have a couple of very dedicated uh, research programs of infantile spasms, traumatic brain injury, and in genetics, and I'll talk a little bit about the genetics one at the end because it's most relevant. Um, we just did an analysis and more than 92% of everything that CARE has funded in the last almost 20 years has gone for intractable pediatric severe epilepsies. So they've just, they've, they've seeded a lot of really good research with not a lot of money, 48 million is not that much. So I'm also a mother and I came and met um, up with Susan Axelrod and the CARE folks in, about 1998 when they were founded is when I first learned about them. And um, I was a young mother, this is my, my daughter, my son, um, I think I was 23 years old, and our introduction to the world of epilepsy uh, looked just like this. Um, we came into the room and found our daughter uh, hacking and gagging in the throes of a grand mal seizure. Um, she quickly went on to develop other seizure types like this, myoclonic, atypical absence, myoclonic aesthetic. She had been a healthy two and a half year old up until that point when seizures started. She had a few seizures, all tonic clonics in the beginning, and then by the time she was three, she was having multiple seizure types. She was going into status epilepticus, non-convulsive type frequently, and nobody could tell us why. Why we had this healthy child who was two and a half, who had developed typically, not precocious, not delayed, all of a sudden started having seizures and having her life completely derailed. And as we watched Savannah grow and develop, we started to see that the epilepsy was taking its toll. During that time, at her best, she was having five to ten seizures a day. At her worst, she was having hundreds too many to count. And so this is the point that, that I started, you know, asking questions about a few years in. Um, she had a procedure at two and a half, but she wasn't diagnosed with lennox gastro syndrome until she was five. And there were a number of reasons for that, one being that the doctors didn't want to label her with this terrible word epilepsy because it might follow her around in her life. But in hindsight, after 40,000 or more seizures, it didn't really seem <laughs> relevant, right? Um, another reason was video EEG monitoring was just coming on the scene back in 1998. And so it wasn't standard practice the way that it is today. So it's hopeful for me to think that we've made at least a little bit of progress. It's not fast enough, it's not good enough, but it's better than it was back then. I started to ask questions um, about epilepsy because we felt completely alone when we had this very, very sick child. And I, as in my own just research as a 23-year-old mother of this sick child, I found out that epilepsy is a spectrum disorder and it affects more than 3 million people in the U.S. That's 1% that's, uh, of the population. So just to give you an idea, that's more than autism, it's more than Parkinson's, it's more than a number of other diseases that we know so much more about. I started to learn that, that 33 to 44 percent of all cases of epilepsy are actually uncontrolled. They don't just take a pill and get better. It's a huge number of patients out there like, like my child. And the thing that was most disturbing to me was this the idea that 70 percent of people with epilepsy didn't know the cause, and that wasn't appalling to anyone that would tell me that. They're like, oh, 70 percent of people don't know the cause, and you're in the majority, congratulations. And it was like, what? <laughs> so. This is something that, that um, really was devastating to me. In addition to this idea that, that research dollars for epilepsy are, are significantly low, um, epilepsy is 10 times more common than Parkinson's disease, but receives six times less funding. And that's not that I don't want funding to go to Parkinson's, but I want funding to go to epilepsy too. And so these are the statistics and the facts that drove me in the early days to go back to college. 
um, and really began to do research. And it took me about 12 years, um, but ultimately got a PhD in neuroscience um, with this idea that I wanted to help the next generation of savannas out there, that we're going to develop intractable epilepsy, epileptic encephalopathy, whatever it was going to be. And I came in right at the era um, of, of genomic medicine. So I started this in 1998. Two genes had been identified at that point for epilepsy, uh, CHRNA4 and SCN1B. The Dravet channel hadn't even been found. And I came into my postdoc, um, so I did all of my training as genes were beginning to be identified, but I came into my postdoc. This pointer is not working here. Nope, I just turned it off. Um, right as the escalation of next generation sequencing um, uh, became commercially available, and it was my job as a, as a scientist to, to bring that technology to the lab, to identify genes in families of patients that had epilepsy and severe neurological disease, and then create cell-based animal models, making iPSCs, making animal models, looking at, at exactly how the gene functioned, and identifying a precision therapy. Long before, there were a whole group of us that, that and many in this room, that believed in precision medicine before it was ever precision medicine, right? It was um, targeted therapy or whatever it was called. And so um, I got, I started doing my research um, right at that time and uh, wanted to be a part of the group of people that were looking for the causes of epilepsy. Because no, you, you do need to know the cause if you want to create a targeted treatment. And I was convinced that the reason that 33 to 44% of people with epilepsy weren't responding to the currently available therapies is because we didn't know why they had epilepsy. And genetics was proving to be the answer. And so the paradigm back in 1975 was really that 70% of people didn't know the cause. And in 2014, it was looking that way. But the thing that was starting to change it was genetics. And we don't know how many of that 70% are going to now come down to it uh, having a genetic cause, but we know that genetics is playing a role in everyone's epilepsy in some way, shape, or form, whether it's driving the epilepsy, like in the case with SCN8A, or it's, it's playing a modifier effect, or if it's uh, response to medication, genetics is becoming more and more important. And we also know that um, between 25 and it's actually predicted that it'll be as high as 50 percent, but between 25 and 50 percent of all of the severe pediatric onset epilepsies have a genetic driver. And at Cure now, we're tracking to more than 300 genes, SCN8A, which is one, that are driving epilepsy in these young kids like, like my daughter, like your kids, that, that have severe, horrible epilepsy. And that doesn't answer all of the question, but it answers some of the question where we can start making a difference in the future by actually targeting treatments for that disease. So um, it took me 12 years to uh, get an associate's, bachelor's, master's, and a PhD, um, and um, mostly because I needed to remediate quite a bit after high school. But um, at home, Savannah was not doing well, and I, I don't think I saw my husband for, for those 12 years. Um, he had the uh, day shift, I had the night shift, and we just were shifts passing in the night. And so for the 16 years, Savannah um, seized every day. Uh, I kept uh, the, the meticulous records because there was nothing else I can do. She had more than uh, 40,000 seizures during this 16-year time period. It took them three years to diagnose her and seven different neurologists. She tried and failed 26 different therapies, everything from diets to devices to medicines to uh, uh, cockamamie things that we were just going to try because, damn it, we don't know what else to do. Um, her monthly drug costs were almost $2,000. She was getting diastat at least once a week, if not three times a week. And thank we were thankful that diastat actually worked because if diastat doesn't work at home, you go to the hospital and you get treated Sanavan and then you get put into a medical coma, as many as you guys know, which was something that happened to us a number of times. She's had five surgeries and the cause of her epilepsy still remained known, unknown. And so I never got into this with this idea that I was going to help my own child. And I, I've never been so happy to be wrong about something, but what I was wrong about was that I really thought that the damage had been done. After 16 years of uncontrolled seizures, my daughter is 18 years old, what could we possibly do to, to fix all of the damage? And um, God, I'm so glad that we were wrong. Uh, I was doing a postdoc in the lab and I was uh, the lead researcher, my, my PI, said to me, he said, you know, how's your daughter? And I said, oh, God, she's a mess. She's having 300 seizures a month. She's seizing every day. She's going into status at least once a week, if not three times a week. She's fading. She spends 17 hours of sleep. Um, she can't talk. She can't get her words out. She, she's back in diapers. She's a mess. 
And he said, let's sequence her exome. And that was my job in the lab. So I sequenced her exome and um, did a, a lot of science and a, a little bit of what I call crazy mother analysis to try to find what was driving the epilepsy in Savannah. And what we found was that she has um, uh, seven mutations in L-type calcium channel gene. She actually has a total of 25 mutations in all of the calcium signaling pathways. So it's just a clustering all of her high impact genetic variants into a single pathway and then narrowing it down. And seven of those are actually in a very specific type of calcium channel, an L-type calcium channel. Um, so you can see the little red dots on the, on the left side are, are where each of the mutations exist in the calcium channel. And I think all of you guys in the room are very familiar with how calcium channels uh, uh, function in neurons presynaptically and postsynaptically. And so uh, at this point, we started to make a case for each of the variants, whether or not they were pathogenic, um, what evidence existed in the literature, what research we could do in the lab to, to try to show pathogenicity. And, and, and the evidence was all pointing to these being gain of function calcium channel mutations. And at that time, I remembered something that I had known for a long time about at epilepsy, but had been dismissed by countless doctors, including myself, was that every time that she went on calcium supplementation, a very, very common um, thing that is done in patients who are on anti-seizure drugs because of the osteoporotic effects of the seizure meds, she would have more seizures. And it was always dismissed as not as not being relevant, as being this just this weird or not important, or hmm, that's interesting, but I don't know what to do with it, um, including by myself. And all of a sudden, it made clear sense to me. She gained a function calcium tan mutation. She gets worse on increased levels of extracellular calcium. So we made a case for putting her on an L-type calcium channel blocker. It's an FDA-approved drug for arrhythmias and hypertension called verapamil. And um, we checked her heart to make sure it was working, and we had pretty strong biological evidence that this was not going to kill her. Um, but frankly, at 300 seizures a month and status every week, um, she, she wasn't living, really, and we weren't sure how long she was going to live. And it worked. Let's see if the picture will pop up. So uh, Savannah was 18 years old when she went on verapamil, and she's 23 years old today. It's been six years. She has had, for the entire six years, after trying and failing 26 different therapies, a 95% reduction in her seizure number for all six years, for those of you that have had honeymoon periods on your drugs, and a 100% reduction in her status epilepticus. She doesn't go into status anymore. So it's a huge change of life for us. And her seizures now occur at night. She still has uh, seizures, uh, which we'd like to get rid of, and we're thinking of ways to maybe do that. But the fact that she has had this response and had it for so long and the impact that it's had on her is um, mind-blowing to me. Again, I, I mentioned I've never been so happy to be wrong, but Savannah is awake, talking, walking, happy, sassy, bossy. Oh, God, is she bossy. And for the first time uh, six years ago, I met that two-year-old that I knew before she started having seizures. And it was just such a great thing. So I have a little video here. You can't hear it, but this is Savannah interacting with her seizure response dog, Yukon. You can see her. She's just awake. She's laughing. She's talking. She's being silly. And so, um, oh, there she is. <laughs> she doesn't spend her day seizing unconscious. High five. This is my girl. So she's doing uh, better than we ever could have dreamed. Um, six years ago, I was constantly asking when I was going to bury my child, and now I'm taking her to Special Olympics, and she's playing basketball, and she's playing baseball. Oh, my gosh, she's playing baseball. Oh, my God, what are we doing? And um, she's uh, in therapeutic horseback riding. She actually has a life, and she can talk to me. She can get the words out, and it's it's a complete turnaround, and, and it's, it's one anecdotal story that speaks to the power of what you guys are seeing now, is that if you get your kids on the right drug and you get them on it early, that you can really make a difference in, in, um, in their outcome. And that's what we want. We want more of that for this, this DNA treatment of drugs. And you guys are already living and breathing us, but you'd be surprised about how hard this is. What you guys have here where you have a genetic diagnosis and a whole group of researchers that have rallied around you and scientists and clinicians that are coming and, and helping you to identify therapies is a big deal because of those other 300 genes, 
there aren't that many that actually have uh, the support community that you have, and and you will make a difference in this disease. And hopefully, you know, 10 years, uh, two years, uh, do it fast, please, because you know, you know, we need it fast. But you'll be looking back at all of the good work you've done, and it comes down to the moms and the dads bringing everybody together and fighting for our kids. So I just want to spend a couple minutes just talking about what I've done since then, um, in addition to Savannah doing very well and, and, uh, and um, my coming to work at Cure. So we're very interested in this idea of precision medicine, and we want to make this happen for as many patients and as many types of epilepsy as we can. And so one of the things that we've started is the Epilepsy Genetics Initiative, and this was started uh, too, it was conceptualized about three years ago based on the idea of what we had done with Savannah. Getting an early diagnosis is crucial because we know there are critical periods of development where you have got to treat within a window of time, otherwise treating late can have a more devastating outcome. So getting a rapid diagnosis to patients as quick as we can, finding more genes, and then feeding them into researchers as best as we can. So if you haven't um, heard of EGI, I would love for you guys to go to the website to learn more about it. What it is is we've created a DNA repository for patients who have had exome sequencing done or genome sequencing, whether in a genetic testing company lab or in a research lab. And you can have your data um, put into EGI, and every six months we will analyze and reanalyze the data for you. We will return the results to your physician. And the idea is, is that if you had an exome sequence done four years ago, not you guys, because you have a diagnosis, but if you had exome sequencing done four years ago and it hasn't been analyzed since then, you're missing something. And so we need to get that data out and we need to be reanalyzing it and have it in the hands of the epilepsy genetics research experts. In addition to that, um, analyzing the data every uh, six months, we will report what we find back to your treating physician. So if we find something, we are going to tell you. And we're also, if you consent, we'll make the data available for research. And um, so this is something that uh, the idea is, is that there's so much more genetic research to be done. As you've talked about, there are so many other genes that are playing a role in how you respond to drugs and, and the modifier genes for SDNA itself. So there's so much research to do in addition to just finding the driver gene. So we want to make this data available for researchers more broadly so we can start to get some more answers to the questions that you guys are so much further along in answering than so many of the genetic epilepsies. We're not doing this alone. This is in partnership with NINDS, um, with the John and Barbara Vogelstein Foundation, and with all of these academic institutes, as well as a number of advocacy partners. And for the first time this year, we're actually um, piloting with the lennox gasto Syndrome Foundation uh, funding exomes, because the number one thing we hear from families is that you can't, they can't get it covered by insurance, this type of testing. So if we can find a way to actually pay for the exomes and get them into EGI, families will get to a diagnosis faster. So the idea behind EGI now is that it's a database that will do this reanalysis for you and make it available for research, but it's actually so much bigger than that. What we want it to be is um, to also have two additional arms, an education and outreach arm, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second, where we, as we get patients who are diagnosed with uh, SCN8A within EGI, um, we can get them to you as quickly as possible. And we can educate them just generally about genetics and what they need to know and then get them in the hands of the people that can really care for them and plug them in with the researchers as needed. There's also a drive the research arm where we would take the genetic data that we've collected and put out RFAs, um, so requests for applications from scientists to get to fund research that they would do with that data. And so both of those two other arms are being built, built out within EGI and to some degree over the next couple of years. So we do have, <clears throat> excuse me, we do have some um, aspects of the education and outreach program in place. Um, if you go to the EGI website, we have an epilepsy genes page. You guys can see you're there. We're tra we have 76 genes in there now, and we're adding more genes constantly. Brandon is here with me from EGI, so he's constantly doing that. And when you click on the gene, it takes you to information, just general information about the gene, and then also links out to you guys and the other groups that might be relevant them for an SCNA implementation. And I'm really happy to report that I just came from an EGI meeting earlier today where we had um, done the analysis of about 87 patients who had epilepsy that had received, had not received um, a diagnosis. They had variants of unknown significance or they had no diagnosis from their exome. 
And from those 87 that went through our analysis pipeline, we've identified two now that have SCN 8A mutations in an exon that's not currently covered by the genetic testing companies because it's been controversial about whether or not it really exists. And so EGI has been able to establish that this exon in SCN 8A does exist and is mutated in multiple patients. And we're now going back to report this back to the families and working with the genetic testing companies to include this exon in sequencing as they move forward. So we had a conversation today about what the possibility was for more patients if all the companies started screening through all of their own exomes for this exon that they haven't been looking at. What would that mean for the community? So you guys might be getting some more people coming their way for sure. So we're really excited about this. It is working. We also think we've found a new gene in EGI. Um, we have three families now that all have a, a somewhat similar phenotype and a mutation and a, and a new epilepsy gene. So it's working and it's exciting. And if you have patients that, that uh, don't have a diagnosis, for those of you that are clinicians in the room, um, they can be enrolled over the phone remotely. You can become an enrollment site, and it is working. And then for you guys in the SCN8A world, you know, it, it's very important because now we can pass them on to you, and they can get the support and help they need right up front, so no time is wasted for these kids. And all of this came from, you know, we've, we've stood on the shoulders of the people that have come before us to help build, you know, I couldn't have, have, Cure couldn't have done what it did without the mothers and fathers that came before it, and I couldn't have done what I did without Cure, you know, coming before me, and now you guys are taking this on, and I feel like I'm passing the baton. Can I, can I retire now? <laughs> and I feel like I'm passing the baton to like the next generation, but I, I'm, I'm happy for the day when you guys will look back and say, we affected change in a meaningful way. It wasn't fast enough, and it wasn't enough, but the journey that we had to go through is not the same journey that patients today are having to go through. And we're gonna beat this. We've got to cure this. There has to be another day where, where parents are not waking up their kids in their beds in the throes of a generalized tonic chronic seizures, where we're not in the hospital all the time with, with our little ones and we're not, you know, burying them at the frequency that we, that we are. And I want to see that day because um, I've lived it now for 21 years. So. so I'm honored and humbled to be here. Go check out the website for EGI and send us your patients and we will send you uh, them back with a diagnosis as, as they get them. So thank you for having me. I would now like to welcome Dr. Michael Hammer. Thank you. It's um, a real pleasure to be here. We're going to try something a little different. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Alex Encinas and Christian Lagianis. And um, they are part of our team, and I want you all to get to know them. Um, and they're going to be reaching out to you. Um, and I'll explain how, but we're going to try and do a demo of the latest beta test of our, some of the things we're working on on our uh, website. So um, I'm going to show a couple of slides, then Alex is going to take you through what Christian is going to be doing over there on the computer as if you were the person on the computer. And then we'll go back to a few more slides, and I'm going to give you some of the results of the survey that we just ran, which is really exciting. And um, Maybe we could have the first couple slides here. Okay. Can you please get ready for your computer right now? Um, this is really directed at the families. Um, we, the power we have as a group, I'm sure we've already gotten this message tonight. Um, we have real power to change the world. And Tracy said it right, moms and dads can change the world. So what we're really trying to do is provide a mechanism by which we can accelerate that change, and you will be the entities and the activities, the agencies by which that change occurs. And we have not yet described this disorder fully. We are just beginning to describe it. We need to see the full spectrum of symptoms that children present. Um, we don't yet know if adults have SCN8A uh, disorders because we're not looking but there could be other phenotypes, um, which would be a great help to Xenon because they need to test their drugs on adults. But in the meantime, we're going to try and uh, 
describe um, the children that have this disorder, all the phenotypes, the genetic variants that these children have, and we're, we're going to be looking for associations between the genotypes, the phenotypes, and the phenotypes and the phenotypes, and describe the patterns that we see. So um, the next slide, um, I guess I have. I'm going to turn this off, right, if I do something. Um, I think this is the one to go forward. So I want to start out by saying uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you and for the generous support that the CUTE syndrome has provided, which is for Elliot. And I would also like to acknowledge the University of Arizona has been a huge help in supporting us with the informatics, the bioinformatics, the computer technology behind what we're doing. They found this to be a compelling project. Everywhere SCNA goes, people find it compelling. 50% of the Xenon, when I went up to visit Xenon and the, you know, the, the lecture room was full, you, it was palpable how much interest and excitement and dedication they had for this for this for SCNA day. It's it's a magical it's a magical cute syndrome. Um, and then of course I want to uh, mention that we are now working with Xenon and Xenon is supporting Alex in doing what she's going to do as the liaison between our website and the families directly. So we're going to try and make this as easy as possible to collect the data that we are collecting. All right. So the next slide. Oh, I I, I arranged that. That's right. So I've just sort of told you what it is. There's a website, scna.net, that we've built. And the purpose, as I've sort of been describing already, to establish a patient database of genetic variants and phenotypes longitudinally. It's very important that we can collect data over and over again. We want to make it easy to go back, and you'll get reminders on when it's time to go back um, and add data. Uh, generate knowledge of the natural history, evolution, risk, outcomes, and genetic basis of this disorder. Accelerate progress in development of new AEDs, uh, anti-epileptic drugs, and treatments, and facilitate collaboration among families, doctors, and researchers. And really what we're going to talk about tonight is how we can facilitate that collaboration among the stakeholders. <clears throat> okay, why, why should I do the, participate? Well, it's kind of obvious, but I wrote down some reasons just for those who aren't convinced. First of all, we might be able to connect you through the mutation that your child has to other families that share that mutation and then allow the connectivity between families with the same, with child with the same mutation and you can learn from each other. And we already know that that's happening, even if you don't share the same mutation, but even more interestingly when you do. Um, provide the most up-to-date information to doctors and scientists. The doctors who are seeing this disorder for the first time need us to tell them more about it. And I know Dr. Mandy Harris has been a godsend for our, our community. Um, we need more doctors out there like, like, like Mandy, and there are many others in this room that are, are, are just doing exactly what she is doing. But doctors don't always tell the patients what they don't know. I'm making a guess here. Maybe that's not completely true, and it's certainly not true in all cases. But we would like to provide a mechanism which doc, by which doctors can talk to doctors or go to a place to get all the information they need to understand what this disorder is. Provide a complete description of the highly variable symptoms of SCNA epilepsy and encephalopathy. Discover relationships between different mutations, clinical symptoms, and outcomes. Aid in the design of new pharmaceuticals that specifically target your child's mutation. By building this database and understanding and describing this in, in, in minute detail, we will be aiding uh, and providing the, the families and the networks that we're building will be critically important for clinical trials. And, and that's why uh, we formed a partnership with Xenon. Um, critical need to enroll as many participants as possible to achieve statistical significance. I'm going to give you some numbers tonight from our survey of 80 respondents, and we're finding, I would say, we have low numbers, but they're supporting some very interesting patterns, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe that to you at the end. So without further ado, I would like to see if we can um, get the Internet working and let you guys take the next few minutes to explain how you can go to the site and um, see our new dashboard and things like that which will um, provide you feedback for, for what your activities are. You can start describing this part right now. Okay. Um, so the whole idea behind the uh, the registry and having a patient and or doctor that work is that 
Well, first, as you saw at the top, uh, when you first go to the website, if you don't have an account, you're just considered a guest. So you can see all of the public uh, level information, um, you know, stuff about drugs, uh, information um, about uh, the genetic variants that are that you might share with somebody else. But when it comes down to the more specific, sort of more private uh, levels, such as the the family forum and getting to the registry, that requires a different a different level of security. So we have two levels of security. The first one is to first create an account. Um, and to create an account, first thing you would do is go to registry. Um, if you haven't ever been to the site, if you don't have an account, if you're not registered, um, the first thing you would see, uh, a little bit of a summary of what Michael talked about, why you should participate, what's going to happen to your data. And then at the bottom of this, it uh, gives you the option to create an account. And this is that first level of security. So when you go to sign up, it's going to uh, ask you for some very basic information. Uh, what username do you want to use? What's the password you'd like to use for the site? Really just creating this... Uh, this basic framework uh, for your account. Okay, I'll keep <laughs> um, once you get through that, like I said, um, there will be options to uh, write where you're from, location-wise, that helps us build a location map, maybe even connect families in uh, similar areas who might uh, have SEA limitations. Um, the, uh, there's a, the second level of security, like I mentioned, there's two levels. The second level is once you've created an account, um, we're going to ask you to fill out a membership form. This just lets us collect data to show that you, um, that you do have a relative with an A mutation. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that the only people who are able to access these private family forms or to fill out the registry questionnaire are individuals who have DNA mutation. Um, so uh, back a little bit back, when you first create an account, you would agree to some rules and policies. Um, and they're just basic guidelines um, to follow on the family forum and on the site. And then this is the to register as a new user, not yet a member. Um, and then you would create the user at the bottom. So to get back to why we have uh, two levels of security, like I said, we want to make sure that only people with, uh, who are affected by AA are seeing these private um, forums and filling out the registry. It also allows us to have different types of accounts. So we, we're looking to have a patient account and we're also looking to have a doctor account. That will help us, like uh, Michael talked about, to allow doctors to talk with other doctors and see uh, different forms and be able to talk on a different level that maybe the patients don't need to be involved with or maybe you guys want to have conversations that you know you don't want your doctors to see or stuff like that. Um, and that would also allow um, for in our registry if we can get it to um, to get to it but um, it will allow uh, once you filled out the uh, registry on our site there's a, a new innovative thing that we're working to do where we get your doctor to sign off and or validate sort of the results you put. And it's really just because when we go to publish these results, a lot of times it comes with a little bit of pushback because, uh, you know, it's self-reported. That there's not, uh, it's not coming from a, uh, a scientific and or, you know, a doctor saying this is what happened. It's coming from the, the parents. Um, and so this, the sign-off from the doctor will allow us to really just make the data that you provide to us really validated and will allow us to publish it and have that much more weight. So this is the membership form that you would fill out as a, uh, once you have become a user, you've created an account. This is the membership form you would fill out, your name, your relation to the individual with the aid mutation, um, email, city, country. Uh, and then it would also collect uh, more towards the bottom it would collect the information about um, the name of the individual who has the AA. Um, it would also collect their date of birth, the age over this, at which the seizure started. Um, and then towards the bottom, it also collects the specific mutation. Um, we built it in so you have to put in a mutation in order to get confirmed as a member. 
If you don't have it, there's also a box that you would check to show that you don't have any mutation, and the, the only difference with that is then it gets routed to us, and we would just contact you and confirm that, yes, you do have a, an individual who's affected by 8A. Maybe you don't have a report or you can't remember. Um, but we just like to vet those out again. We just want to make sure that the people who get the access to some of these more private sections are really supposed to be there. Excuse me, do they not get access? So you contact them, and then do you wait for the report? Or yeah, then we just sort of have to find out the reason why they don't have the information, if they're going to get it soon. It's kind of like what you have to do when, yeah. you, when people contact you. you Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of so then you'll get notified and then you'll start to contact them and exactly. try and seek that information or help right. obtain it if they're unable to. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we try to do that as quickly as possible. Um, Christian is the one who gets most of the notifications, and as soon as we get that, we'll try and respond almost immediately okay. to really facilitate the to get them in and on the family forum and stuff like that. So Christian, where do we stand? <laughs> so right now we created an account and we also fill out the membership form. Once you fill out the membership form, uh, the next step is to log in again. Okay. Is to log in and um, after that we are going to show you new features as a patient, registered patient within official account. All right, so uh, this is showing after you submitted the membership form, you have an account, you're ready to go. And so what's going to change a little bit, and these changes are very new. If you've been on the site, if you've been to the registry, this will all be very new. So when you click on registry, um, we're now going to be implementing this dashboard. It's very much like your profile on the website. It gives you the ability to see what questionnaires we have on the site for you to fill out, um, and, as well as go to a lot of the other uh, resources on our website. So if you just click on the registry uh, real quick. And so this takes you directly to our disclosure for the, uh, for the registry. Basically outlines this is IRB approved, what we're going to do with your data, that we're going to keep it safe, we're not going to give out your information, it's going to be all de-identified, so your data is safe. Um, it does require at the bottom for you to agree to allow your data to be used for research purposes. So once you hit agree at the bottom, it then takes you into the uh, registry so you can start filling out the questionnaire. This is a very, very extensive questionnaire. Uh, we've broken it into eight different modules. That way, you don't have to feel like you have to fill it out all at once. And the really cool thing about this is you can save it, come back to it later. If there's a question you can't remember, if there is the data somewhere else, you can always save it and then at uh, another time come back, fill it out, and hit submit at that point. Like I said, this is just, um, he's going through the, the different modules. You can hit continue to go through each module all at, at, module all at once, um, or you can go back and, um, like I said, come back at a later time when either you have more time or there's, uh, you have the data available to fill out the rest of the registry. And so now he's just going to go to the end so we can kind of show you, once it's been submitted, the other thing that we're really working to help facilitate, facilitate uh, this doctor approval uh, to validate your data. So this is the last module, at which point you get to submit it. Um, when you go back to your dashboard, it'll show that you now, the registry is still listed under your available questionnaire. Um, and if you open it up, it shows that it's pending approval. And again, that's just waiting for doctor's approval. This is a completely optional step. You don't have to send it to a doctor if you don't want to. Um, this is just something, like I said, it's to help us validate the data and just make it stronger when we go to publish and give out this information. Notice the point system, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so then by the submitting thing... these, you get points. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the other thing is we're starting to implement a reward system. So as you fill out different questionnaires, different surveys that we have available, you're going to be awarded so many points. And after so many points, you're going to get 
an Amazon gift card and stuff like that. It's because we really want to make sure that you guys are coming back. The idea of the registry, we want to collect longitudinal data. So anytime something changes, we want to get an update. We want to know, did a drug stop working? Did a new drug start working for you? Because um, this will really help us characterize what's going on with your children. Um, and then the other really cool thing is that you have a history where it will pull up a PDF that shows everything that you submitted with that uh, questionnaire. And this is something that you can keep for your files if you come back in six months to fill it out again and you want to know, well, what did I put you know, six months ago? Is it, was it the same? Has it changed? This will be available and then you can see what you filled out at that time and then update as necessary. Like I said, it would be adding the doctor. So you'll see uh, on the dashboard there's now the option where you can add a doctor. And again, like I said, this is totally optional. A doctor can't add you as their patient. You are the only one who can add them. You can also change your doctor. You can remove them so they no longer have access to see your data. Um, so if your doctor isn't in the system, there's a way for you to send them an email. Let them know they'll get an invitation. Let them know that they have a patient who has joined the site and that their information is there ready to view. If they're already in the system, you would just be able to select their name from the drop-down and then click Add Doctor. Um, and, then, yeah. and then they would now show up under your name as what your doctor is. And like I said, you can add more doctors, you can change the doctor, and uh, you can always remove the doctors at any time. And so then on the doctor's side, this is another portion that we are working on um, and hoping to roll out very soon. Doctors, like I said, if they don't already have an account, they would send them the invitation. They would create an account similar to how anyone as a patient would create one. And then the only difference is that they would go and they hit the registry. Instead of filling out that membership form, they would fill out a doctor form. So this one is just a little bit different. It asks for information about who they're affiliated with, how many patients uh, are they seeing, uh, who have 8A, and then it's also going to ask if they want to be part of our doctor directory. And this is really just to help create a site where we can make sure that we are being as effective as possible in really reaching out to as many clinicians, physicians, uh, who are helping treat individuals with 8A. And then once they have registered, As you may see, this is an example of how a doctor can submit their data to register in the database. And based on this information, we can have them in a repository for patients who need to select a doctor later on. And once they finish it, they can, uh, a patient can see these doctors, and doctors will be able to see patients who selected them previously. Um, if we go to uh, the, the doctor who, who has been selected by patient, well, by this patient account, we can see that if we go to the registry, doctors have this new feature, which is the doctor's dashboard. And from here, we have uh, a simple application where they can select the patient who has selected them, and from there, if they already have um, PD, um, registry submissions or any other questionnaires who have been submitted in the last month, 
they can click on here and get some uh, information about their submission. Um, this will also give the physician to, a chance to comment, add any additional notes um, about uh, you know, specific seizures, if there is additional information that they feel might be relevant, they could add it in the comment box and then hit approve. And then once they hit approve on the patient end of things, um, when it said that you had a, a pending approval, it would then move down and show that it was completed and there's nothing else to do on that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that gives you an idea of what this is gonna look like. Um, if you have feedback for us, let us know. Do you have those little things to match up? Oh, yeah. We do have some uh, old-fashioned ways of signing up for any of the clinicians who are still here. We can, we've got some name and address forms for you to fill out so we can add you to our doctor directory if you're not already on it. Okay, so uh, oh, we better go back to these slides. So now I want to, uh, oh, there was, if you notice, there was a button that said survey button on one of the menu, on the menu items on the live site. So that's what we had open for five weeks. And in five weeks, we got 80 respondents, which is really great. And now I'm going to review some of the uh, patterns and, and things we've learned from the respondents to, to our survey. We made the survey as easy as possible, short as possible, 26 questions. Um, and part of what this will do over time, we hope, is uh, the doctor-patient networks that we're building will be a record uh, for, for drug companies or people who want to, uh, companies that want to try new, uh, try to do cl clinical trials, we'll have um, these networks that will indicate, you know, I've drawn a little schematic here, um, over time we'll see where we have um, um, numbers of patients and doctors that are treating scn 8 a which will make it easier to, to get these clinical trials out. And so here's the disclosure, as you already saw. Let me just give you an overview. We had uh, a range, age range of our respondents for their children, one year and one month, to 18 years, nine months, a mean of about five, five and three quarters years. Age at first onset of seizures, the mean was at 3.9 months, but stay tuned, you're gonna see that that's uh, conditional. Um, very interestingly, more males and females um, responded. And then when I looked at as much of the information I could find in our database of larger number of patients, that this ratio holds up, 57% males, and it's statistically significant. I've never seen this before. I'm not quite sure why we would have more males uh, who are at least being um, coming to us with SCNA Day. Um, this shows you some of the, the, the spectrum of mutations that we've seen in our survey. There's about 77 of the 80 shown here. We didn't have time to add the last few. Um, you can see some of them. Uh, which one is the uh, pointer? The top one? Okay, good. So some of them are recurrent. So you can see there's six individuals here. There's five individuals here, eight here, five here, and so on and so forth. So we're seeing recurrent spots in the uh, gene. Uh, even with our survey respondents. Now this is an interesting thing. We showed last year that um, the age of onset is kind of bimodal where we had, um, in this case, um, upper 20, 28% of our respondents, the, the ch children had seizure in the, in the neonatal phase. So in the first month of life, we already heard that women have in, in utero uh, tremors and, and probably what might be called seizures. Um, so there's a about a quarter or more of our patients um, have very, very early onset seizures, which is really unprecedented um, for this type of seizure. And then you see that um, there's a, a, good, a good portion. Last year I showed that this looked like a little bell curve over about uh, five months. Well, you're seeing that there's uh, an increase in the number of seizures uh, onset around three or four months. And then we get this new little blip out here around nine to 10 months. So I'm not sure this is a trimodal curve, but it possibly could be, and we'd like to know why there are patients with early, early onset seizures and some patients with later onset seizures, and we'd like to compare the phenotypes of these patients. The seizure frequencies vary extremely widely, so you'll see that um, this shows you a, a histogram. I've left the outliers. This is seizures per month. You can see out at the end of this is 600 per month, which is a huge number, but we've left out some of the ones reporting up to 150,000 seizures a month. Um, 
The range, uh, and the one I've shown here other than these outliers, is two seizures a month to 620 seizures a month, with a median of about 40 seizures, seizures a month from our respondents. Seizure semiology and the response to meds. Here you can see the various seizure types in general categories, generalized, partial, infantile spasms, febrile, you can notice that this is not um, Dravet syndrome, and other. Um, what you see here is a surprisingly high refractory rate, which is probably not surprising to us as families. However, if you noticed what Tracy said, there are about, no, was it, was it Tracy, did you say there, she already left, but um, the, typically you'll see about 30% refractory for, um, if you survey epilepsy patients here, we're double that. So 71% of our, our children are refractory to one, two, three, four, five different medications. Uh, only 25% controlled, and interestingly, we have a few cases where there are no seizures at all. This is just uh, the response to how did medications, you, how did uh, the medications work for your child, and we did get this big Keppra peak here where it was made things worse or had no effect. Some of the sodium channel blockers here are having, you can see the blue colors, uh, an improvement, and so I think you can see with, just you blur your eye, you'll see that there's more shifting over to those sodium channel blockers, but not extent not exclusively by any means. Of course, this is very uncontrolled because all the kids are on different cocktails of AEDs. So for developmental skills, we asked, um, does your child have head control, manual dexterity, sit independently, walk, and speak? And you can see that, um, that we have about 70% um, that have head control, but that means 30% don't. That's pretty striking uh, because these are all for kids that are only two years or older. That's a very striking number. Um, for speaking, you know, uh, we have only about 16, that 16 percent that can speak well, but 64 percent are nonverbal, another very important feature for SCNA to epilepsy and encephalopathy. I'm just showing experience with alternative treatments. Um, you can see alternative diets like the keto diet, where it, some, it was a slight majority that said yes versus yes for a while, but most said no. Uh, for a vagus nerve stimulator, we had a lot that said no, but there are only 10 respondents there, so that's seven people said no, two people said it helped, and yes, one said yes for a while. And then look at cannabis oil, which seemed very promising as an alternative treatment. So uh, we're doing re research in our lab on Miriam's model uh, that's been uh, talked about so much with CBDs and just beginning to do that work. We think it's very important to look at this in more detail. Um, so the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is the surprising thing that nobody's really seen before, and that is we asked the question, are there genotype-phenotype associations? And the question is, uh, if you have the same mutation with other patients, do you share more features with them, or, and are there differences between patients with different mutations? And so what I'm going to do is just point out, since we had five people in our survey uh, that were over two that, was, that had 850Q, and we had five that uh, had 1877. Um, I'm going to compare them head to head and see how they look. So here's the 850Q versus 1877. You can see the mean age is very similar. For the 1852, it was six years, two months. For 1877, it was five years, nine months. Notice seizure status 850Q, 100% refractory. 1877, 100% seizure free for six months or more. Then you look at the developmental skills, and you can see that I didn't forget to plot the 850Q. There just aren't developmental skills. There's no head control, no manual dexterity, whereas in 1877, 100%. So these are striking differences. Notice that in the seizure onset, the 850Q seizure onset is much earlier than the 1877 seizure onset, which goes up to seven or eight months, and there's no overlap between them in these small number of samples. And the seizure types also differed. Notice that the seizure types for the 1850Q, 50% uh, of those patients have infantile spasms, whereas in the 1877, none did. So I think, you know, I'm going to end, the, end it here. I just want to say that it's very promising, the kinds of things we saw in just a very brief survey, and that um, what promises even greater uh, return is getting this kind of return in terms of numbers of respondents for our longer survey, we will learn a great, great deal about what our children are suffering from and be able to communicate that to the researchers and the clinicians to better treat our children. And then this is something we can do right now. We're discovering things that are actionable right now. We don't have to wait for the next 
uh, new compound or drug to get on the market. And so you moms and dads really can make a big difference to your treatment of our own children today. Thank you so much. Okay, so as promised, we ran over again this year, and you guys are all still here, which is really pretty amazing. Thank you so much for staying. Um, you want to? I just, I just want to thank you all again for what was an amazing event. I think we always have a vision of how we think things will go, and just like last year, I feel so fulfilled and overwhelmed and excited about this community and everyone rallying together. Um, thank you. I know you've all traveled. You have very busy schedules this weekend. I know the, the convention's just beginning, and you've stayed out really late with us. So we thank you, um, and we're excited to see where the future takes us together. Um, and uh, please grab all of the goodies off the tables. Um, there's cups and magnets and clinician guides for those of you who are clinicians. And I just wanted to end on a note about just the kind of hope that I feel um, was inspired in this room. Um, I think for our families and uh, and I hope for the rest of you who, who do this work, uh, both for long-term vision toward uh, you know, clinical trials and drug treatment and short-term vision towards being able to talk to our doctors about options for our kids. Um, and for also, I just want to give a, a acknowledgement to the SCN2A people who are in the back um, who came, who we're going to be meeting with tomorrow to, to talk as uh, Dr. Pearl suggested. We, you know, we need to be working across, uh, across lines. So we'll be, we, we all, all will be doing that. Um, so we hear you and uh, thank you so much, all of you for being here. Um, if you were a speaker tonight, whether it was a family member or a professional speaker, we do have just a little um, power bank travel charger for all of you. So who doesn't need to charge in a, on a whim, right? <laughs> so thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you.